when we did do for love Pac had passed away yeah and Afini called me and said you know I only want people he has a lot of material we think about putting out some stuff he didn't finish but I only want people that he really worked with to do it and I remember she came up and actually the first song we did was not do for love it, it, it was I wonder if heaven got a ghetto mm. and I don't know if you can imagine we were sitting with Afini and we had these big speakers and we just put the acapella up because there's no music underneath. But actually he starts playing these chords and he does some changes that are unusual for an R&B writer. And they write this song. We go to Clive and now he's at the Bellis Hotel, always a bungalow eight. I'm sure you've heard that from other people. <laughs> that was Mecca. And when we came there, Prince walked out casual, casually, Oh, hello, Prince. Again, maybe we're just not meant to be here. Like, this is just too <laughs> high level. Like, and we go in and we press play, and he stops after the first song. We have three songs again, and he goes, for one second. And he goes, Roy Lott, I need you to go in the room with Soul Shark and Collins' manager. We're buying this record right now on the spot. And I need, they're not leaving until they sign the contract. I see a golf cart coming, and I kid you not, Bobby and Whitney coming up in a golf cart. Bobby's holding a <laughs> ball of Tennessee. The golf cart is swirling like this. <laughs> and Robin goes, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, I want to welcome you to another edition of Halftime Chat, and today I've got another special guest. Um, I'm talking to the producer, he's also a DJ, and he name, he goes by the name of um, Soul Shock, um, and he's part of the big R&B um, production crew of Soul Shock and Carlin um, out of Denmark. So it's going to be great talking to him, seeing his um, his career, his background, his inspiration, and um, and talking about going through some of the tracks that he produced from Whitney Houston's Heartbreak Hotel, Monica's Before You Walked Out of My Life, Do For Love by Tupac, and uh, so many others. Okay, take care. Back? Yes, yeah, fine. Okay, great. Then we'll just do it without earbuds. How are you? I am doing very well. I'm doing very well. Uh, it is about 10 o'clock here in the UK. Uh, yeah, I was just about saying you guys run it late, huh? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, um, you know, I, I, I'm a full time mental health therapist working with children. So this is oh, my. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so I, I do my clinics in the morning. So when everyone goes to bed, my kids, my wife, then I can do my hobby at night. <laughs> and you can do your thing. Do my thing, yes. Then you can do your show. <laughs> Yeah, I can do this. So yeah, and I, and I and I started this during lockdown, and and it's I can, yeah, it's been fun just hearing the stories, and um, you know, putting a face. I mean, as I said, I, I most of us even know how you look like. We hear, we know your music, but we don't even. <laughs> yes, yeah. Let um, me tell you one thing. It's so funny when it was this big website, uh, one of those soul R and B websites, and they put out a picture of us, and they're like, "This is all the hits they were doing," and people were like. No way. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Don't tell me these two white boys from Denmark did know all those records. No way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, being British, well, I'm I'm British. I, I went to university in America, but the, there's a lot of soul, you know, from George and Michael. Um, we know the Beatles, they enjoyed sort of rock and roll. Oh, so yeah. it's understandable here in the UK. I mean, most of our DJs play soul and R&B and stuff and hip hop. Yeah. So, but I know in America, yeah. it's very much, it's very different. So, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we're recording, but I yeah, can, yeah, yeah. We I can, can tell yeah. you if you want. Yeah, but this, you know, since we're touching that subject, you know, we came over here, you know. Well, I got to go further back because, you know, my original start to the music industry and everything is because of these two guys here at my desk. You okay. know, I was a DJ for many years. And in 1989, uh, I became third in the world in uh, the world championship in mixing and scratching, which was DMC. It was held at Royal Albert Hall. Okay, here you know, it was England. Who had yeah, well, yeah, they had their world championship, and um, one of the judges were, were was DJ Red Alert. 
Oh, okay. And that's really the beginning of my career because, uh, you know, I lived with my parents. I was so young. So I just went back to my little farmer town in Denmark, and it truly was. And then I got a phone call from Flavor Unit, and that was DJ Red Alert's new management company he had with a guy called Dave Funkenklein. And he said, uh, we really like that show you did. We're doing a tour with Queen Latifah, Jungle Bros, Chill Rock G, and True Mathematics. And we want you to DJ on that tour, but not just do your show. We want you to also be Latifah's DJ and Chill Rock G's DJ and True Mathematics DJ. I mean, it was just, what? Say that again? You know, it was such an incredible, incredible honor. And I flew to New York. And I, for me, I was just into the music. You know, my my first experience with music was Grandmaster Flash, The Wheels of Steel. Wow. And um, ever since I heard that record, it was just, that's it. And, but I didn't know the culture of hip hop. I didn't know really what it expressed. I just liked the music and I could hear what they were talking about. But I was just, the beats and everything was really what I was focused on. And I came to New York and I stayed with, Audio 2 and MC Light. Oh, wow. and, uh, yeah, they were kind of helping me out a little bit because they were friends with Red Alert and stuff like that. But I mean, it was like, whoa. All of a sudden, I was in it. And I was in Brooklyn, Flatbush Avenue in the late 80s. And, and my mom was like, how is it? And I'm like, <laughs> quite different. <laughs> <laughs> and doing that whole venture, that was my whole point because we're touching this subject of, you know, and being a little white boy in hip hop music, we really it didn't exist. It was there were no M and M's mm. at all. There were like you know a few <clears throat> third base <clears throat> later yeah, on yeah. Yeah, had a, a, a white kid, but it was really unusual. And uh, you know I'm so thankful to this day that Latif and and Red Alert gave me this experience because I would go on this tour and I would tour in a lot in Europe too. But a lot of times when I went on stage, I got booed. <laughs> Oh, wow. In, in Europe or in the U.S.? Well, because, you know, they were here to see, like, straight out the jungle. The team was wearing African costumes. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, jungle boss were, like, in full jungle gear and stuff like that. So I had to scratch and scratch and mix real fast. And I was like, oh, okay, he's cool. Whatever. <laughs> and it came up to me actually a little bit on the tour bus. I remember after many months of touring, you know, I was just, like, and also experiencing, you know, New York. I got shot at in New York. At a, what? Yeah, at a club, where, you know, Red Alert had to spin in different clubs around in New York, but hip hop clubs in like 1989 were like, it was gritty. And, you know, yeah, there was someone who wasn't feeling the DJ, you know, and I just, you know, it was just a really rough experience coming from Denmark. And I remember saying to the chief, you know what, after we've been touring for a while, I said, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Maybe I should not be doing this. Yeah, did did, <laughs> you know? did, it, did you get did the bullet actually hit you? No, we I, I didn't get hit. No, I didn't get hit. You know, the the promoter just told me that there's something going on. Just people in the crowd getting rowdy, and you know, and also, yeah. also, what's this white boy doing up there? Kind of thing, you know, what kind of oh. thing? It was just it was just a, one of those, you know, it was a tough little feeling back. And you know, yeah. it's not like England where we used to different cultures and hip hop. You know, yeah. post hip hop in England were mixed and stuff like that you know it was never really an issue because you know we as a as a country England Denmark especially Denmark yeah. you know it's just more natural but oh, in New York no not a, not in the late 80s it yeah was, yeah yeah it was unusual um but anyways I just remember he was like oh yeah you gotta duck down on the turntables you know <laughs> stay safe. and I'm like what are you talking about and I'm like have my needles up and I just hear over me and I wish I could tell you some Superman story, but I <laughs> crawled on all fours out and called my mom from the phone box as we had in New York back then and, and said, I'm coming home. So I had experienced some stuff. And I just remember saying to the chief, you know, I was like, you know, I love this music so much. I really, I, I mean, I, I'm, I am so into this music and I, I, I live and breathe it. But, you know, I'm just starting to sense maybe not. And she took my hands, she <laughs> my hands, and she goes, don't you ever let the color of your skin make it determine any decisions in life for you. And it was so reversed because, you know, hey, wait, I'm the white. Okay, but she used some of the experiences she felt in being in a, a, a female white world or something. Yeah, yeah. And it was just, it was just incredible. And she, it, that was really the moment when I'm like, okay. Okay, thank you because you know I respect her so much. So, 
I owe so much to to Red Alert and the teeth of my and Jungle Brothers for the beginning of my career. Yeah, well, I mean, it'd be great to go back to the fact that you're from. Uh, well, I always ask my guests where they were born and raised. Uh, you've said Denmark. Now, um, most of us know Denmark as the home of Lego and and Danish <laughs> pastry. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, outside of, and, and cows, and you know, I'm a little. Let me bring surprised. out my Lego here for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have a big Lego yeah. mix at the back. Yeah, you hey, good one. Can you get me some Legos, please? <laughs> <laughs> and as a Liverpool supporter, the, the home of Carlsberg beer. But what was it like growing up oh, in Denmark? <laughs> I am, you know, you know, Liverpool. And my my best friend supports Liverpool. You know, Jan Mowgli, myself, Madrid, yeah. and my yeah, and my again, Mulby was amazing. And you, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you had some other things. Yeah, and we had Daniel. Couple, maybe he was the biggest one, but. Daniel Agger? I was just about to say, great yeah. defensive player. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Oh, my God. My <laughs> team is Madrid. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we're good. Yeah. But, but what was um, it like growing up in Denmark? You know, very, you know, I'm from the northern part of Denmark, which is kind of like, it's yeah, called Greece, Jutland. In Greenland, or is it? Yeah, Jutland is called, yeah. So you got like where the capital is, you know, Copenhagen. Copenhagen we're yeah. not, we're the farmers. Okay. We're uh, Jotland, a lot of cows, wow. a lot of farms, and uh, I grew up with very traditional home. My dad was uh, uh, working at the uh, uni- professor at the university and stuff like that. Very academic family. So when I said, "Yeah, I'm going to New York to make beats," <laughs> just not at all registering. No idea what I was talking about. But they got used to the sound of this because I was practicing eight hours a day in my room on my turntable. So. You know, but we're growing up really traditional upbringing in Denmark. And, uh, you know, I remember around those years, 11, 12, 13, 14, you, you, you start to want to fit in, yeah. right? So team, you find your little click. And it was really hard in Denmark because first I was like, you know, I was a little bit of a tough guy. You are in the farmers. You're always like, you know, <laughs> farmer boys always, you know, farmer boys. Yeah. And uh, so I was kind of like with the, rock you know heavy metal uh, bike kind of thing and i'm like listening to the music you know and i'm like this is terrible wow so i left that and then i went in the other posse that was kind of like they were listening to wham okay like pink song and stuff and i'm like this is terrible <laughs> and i had such a hard time fitting in that i kind of hanging out with people who listen to the cure and six mm. pistols and stuff like that and i just I didn't, you know, I was okay, but I was coming home at night sometimes going, what's wrong with me? How come I can't, like, mm. why, why am I fitting in? And that's the moment when I heard on Danish national radio, Grandmaster Flash, The Wheels of Steel. And I can't explain you why, but mm. it was just a moment for me. I was like, that's it. And I called all my friends, and there's one friend in particular who said, oh, that's that new style from new york it's called hip-hop and i went all in and you got to figure out what to do you're going to make graffiti you're going to rap <laughs> you're going to break dance <laughs> and very fast i found out i was not good at any of those but music spoke to me and i saw all the rappers had djs behind them and i started studying you know all the djs like you know howie t and cash money and jesse jeff and Mixmaster Ice from UTFO. And wow. I got really into studying all the styles, scratching and mixing. And that that was just, that became my life. <laughs> no, no, okay, so I'm, as I said, maybe those in America who might not really comprehend the fact that Denmark, you know, apart from Scandinavia has your yeah, ABBA and Ace of Bass, you, you, you really, it just seems a mile away from hip hop. The fact that your radio station is playing that, it just seems like, well, how did they even get a hold of that? And then I'm sure your parents are like, well, what are they saying? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, no, but the, you're English, oh, you know, hip hop and everything, yeah. Yes, but you know, we had a little bit of a breakdance commercial moment okay. when when hip hop came out. We had the all the big movies breaking and stuff like breaking, that. Breaking, yeah, Toba Nova Zone, yeah, 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 yeah. And there was like, you know, breakdance became like a, you know, everybody's running around with white gloves <laughs> and doing the robot and all that stuff. So it wasn't super unusual. To get into the culture because at that time it had a momentum. I okay. think you probably in, in England too we started seeing people breaking the streets yeah, and stuff yeah, like that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which we had in Denmark too, believe it or not, you know. 
Oh. Uh, but when that faded away, because that was just this break dance trend, you know, then the real hip hop b boys as we were, we stayed on, and that was really challenging because now we were like, "What are you doing with this? That's over." Yeah. You know, I was told over and over, hip hop is over. It's going to be three years, two years. It's never going to be anything. Look at today. Yeah, you know, the hip hop has absolutely outrun any other genre, and yeah. it's impact in commercial businesses like from cars to homes to uh, you know everything fashion you know hip-hop is a major influence of everything yeah. we uh, see in our culture today so oh. that's a big win for us <laughs> yeah no it's true but why why the turntables because um when i interviewed grandmaster d from um, um houdini I said wow. to him, he says, well, you Major know. Major respect for that, by the way. <laughs> you know, that's, he, you know, when you say stuff like that, you go back to my youth here, yes. Yeah, because, you, you know, he was DJ. saying, yes. but back in those days, the DJ was the person and the MC was, you, you get an MC, because the DJ did the parties. And so the MC, they were more right. important than the MC, you know, uh, you know. So it right. was interesting, the fact that. Um, why you decided to do the to, to be the DJ? Were you thinking you, I'm going to get some MCs locally to rap over what I'm doing, or what was it, the, your thoughts? Not at all. <laughs> I was only into how did Grandmaster Flash do the wheels of steel? Wow! And I studied and I found out that he originally did that on three turntables. Oh, so that's why I was so hard to do it too. Because he's changing records really fast. Wow. And when you only have two turntables, you, you will have to have the vinyl stack on top of each other. So you just put it on with this and vinyl to make it as fast as he did it. Yeah. So I just became obsessed with that song. That was all turntable and DJing. So it was pretty clear from the beginning that's what I was going to do. Because it was the sounds that got me into the culture. And also, you know, when I did my first graffiti piece, you know... <laughs> You know, I told my friends they're like, I don't think, I don't think it's going to be a graffiti. You, you know, it is interesting that you actually really um, are a student from hip hop from the beginning because a lot of people might have heard some of the influences of your later production and thought that, oh, he's you know taking stuff from some of our hip hop producers and 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 mixing him, you know, whether it's Dilla and people like that, without realizing. Well, I want to do. His, yeah. I'm, I'm so happy we, we talk about this because that's actually one of the saddest things slash best things. Do for love, we adored Jay Dilla. Jay Dilla for us hip hop producers is God. And Q Tip, too, by the way, just yeah. so you know, he is, those two guys are the first one who starts taking different pieces, but not from the same record they would have like a bridge or something going in before the hook from another record. They would have horns from a third record on top of a other sample. And, you know, I always hated when all these rock producers were like, oh man, you guys are just stealing stuff. Uh, have you tried to put together a hip hop record? Because that's a lot harder to play a Van Halen solo. You can just mm -hmm. copy, you know. It's so complicated to make hip hop. So I never took that. So when we, do for love is a special moment in my life because we have worked with Pac, and you know I'm so happy that I got to work with him. We did a song called Old School, that was one of my first times I worked with him, and that was about East Coast hip hop. It was incredible because I knew everything about East Coast, and you forget Pac is from New York. Mm, you forget. Is, I know he's the West Coast, but no, he is East Coast. So we had so much fun doing that record together because it was all about paying respect to all the original legends. Um, and when the next record I did with him, when he called me, and I remember I was on Sunset Boulevard and he said, you know, man, that record you did is going to be the title for my next album. I don't know if you can imagine being a little white boy from Denmark, but Me Against the World is our song we did with Tupac that was the title of his album. It was so overwhelming. We're so wow. thankful of it. When we did Do For Love, Pac had passed away. Yeah. And Afini called me and said, you know, I only want people, he has a lot of material. We think about putting out some more stuff. 
he didn't finish, but I only want people that he really worked with to do it. And I remember she came up and actually the first song we did was not Do For Love. It, it, it was I Wonder If Heaven Gonna Ghetto. Mm. And I don't know if you can imagine, we were sitting with Afeni and we had these big speakers and we just put the acapella up because there's no music underneath. And he's talking about, I wonder if heaven got a ghetto and he just passed away and Afeni is just crying next to me. Wow. It was almost like speaking down from the speakers. And his original idea was this kind of uh, up-tempo Bruce Horn, I think it was called, piano. And I thought it was okay. And I said to Afeni, can I, can I try to do something else? And she goes, sure. And I did this, I don't know if you know the record, but I did this version of I Wonder If Heaven Got a Ghetto. That's, that's the one they played at least over here in, in, in America. And and I actually let him go. I take the beat half tempo. So Pac kind of bounces, which was the current style. JC is out doing all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was so magical. And I found this cameo sampling, whatever. So I was so excited about it. And, um, and my wife who passed away, Maxie, Oh, uh, right, yeah. who was part of Brownstone, which is a big R and B group. Oh, yes. um, oh that was okay. yeah, that's that's the yeah, that's the mother to my son. Um and she's singing on that record. <laughs> we were, oh. we were just out yeah. And uh then she came back and the uh, record company was so excited about this st- record we've done. I wonder if her him gonna get him. She come in and I have this other one called Do for Love. And um and obviously she played me the, the original song, Bruce. I always forget his name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Said, what do you want to do for love? Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, this is where it comes in. Mm. It's a long journey to get back here. But I, because Pac and I had really bonded over East Coast hip hop, and I was going to make an East Coast record for him because. People didn't associate with that, but I knew Pac and very well, and he was very East East Coast. I mean, the music he listened to was, he grew up listening to like Big Daddy Kane and Molly Malls and Bismarck and all the stuff I grew up with. So there was a remix of Far Side that Jay Dill did. And I took a little horn thing that goes do, 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 do. I loved it. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take that little part, and I love the snare, and the sample, which we are always, by the way, that was this was normal, like mm. premiere, and all, we were all taking, you know, someone had a dope snare, we, we'll make it our yeah. own, but, you know, and that's all there is from that record from Jay Dilla, is the little horn and the snare, and I used that in this, and ever since, it's like, that's Jay Dilla who did this record, or whatever, and, you know, in some way, the way I, when I hear that, I actually get honored. Because I never thought I was as good as Jay Dilla. Mm-hmm. So the fact they could think that that beat was Jay Dilla, you know, instead of taking this as like, no, no, it's me. You know, I'm kind of like, man, that's that's amazing. I'll take that because, you know, and I know that snare and that little horn was characteristic for him. So I don't want to take any way f- away from those two sounds. But that's mm-hmm. all that is from Jay Dilla on that record. Yeah, I mean. And it's I- become his own little momentum. You know, I, the most important thing when I say the story is, Jay Dilla is God. And yeah. the only reason why I took that was almost in some way paying respect to this East Coast record. It yeah. was kind of normal to do that. Like if I had to do something earlier, you know, Molly Ma was the big one. It wouldn't be unusual for me to maybe use the uh, impeach the president's kick and snare that he used so much. You know, it's not yeah. unusual to do that in hip hop. Yeah. So that's the story about the Jay Dilla thing and us doing Do For Love. Well, you know, I mean, uh, I'm a good, good friends with Eric Williams, and 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 so, I, oh, yes. and he who sang the hook on it. So I, yes. I, I love the record for that. For that. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I didn't know anything about Jay Dilla, uh, so I'm not a real hip hop person. It was only when I oh. I put out the fact that I'm going to interview you, and then a few people said, "Oh," <laughs> and commented about this, and I'm thinking, "Oh, I, I." So I didn't know anything about it. So I thought. It's only fair to ask just to bring it Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. as I said, I didn't realize that there was a thing that you even heard about it, that people thought that you, um, um, you know. Yeah, they, you know, I don't know. If, you know, I mean, it's that's the worst part of the story. I don't want to come off as we took someone or mm. took someone's work and put our names on it. I mean, we've done, we've done. Yeah, you've done, yeah. Yeah, you've done tons of records, yeah, you know, yeah. so, you know. 
but, but you know, in that incident, yeah, you know, looking back, maybe I should not have taken that little horn. Maybe I should have not sampled that snare because that created confusion, you know, and that's the last thing I wanted to do. I was just, I wanted Pac to have a little bit of a Tribe Called Quest, which was like my biggest, biggest inspiration mm -hmm. of all. That's also why you hear when Colin, my partner, comes in, you know, I go, I, he goes, well, what are you hearing? What are we doing? I go, Tribe Called Quest. And he just goes, do, 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 do. I mean, that was because it was Tribe Called Quest. So it was natural for me because Dylan and, and, and Q-Tip were, you know, they were the one creating the sound. Yeah. But, you know, that's the confusion for this record. And, you know, I hope everybody who hears this knows that we are only honored to be in that yeah. category. Jake Taylor Plus is the, maybe the biggest hip-hop producer ever. But yeah, and, but I guess it's strange because, and I wonder if this has anything to do with being um, from Denmark and being white, that <laughs> this is big, this is the issue because, you know, my favorite producer is Teddy Riley. Um, oh, and... oh, oh my God. Can we just have a moment? <laughs> I cannot tell you how many hours in the studio I spent trying to get that goddamn Teddy Riley snare. <laughs> He is, I mean, we're touching someone. We, we just talked Jay Dilla. Yeah. You know, this is, you're going straight to my, if you ask who's your all-time, Teddy Riley, by far, is my biggest inspiration. Wow. So sorry, yeah. I just needed a moment. Did you, did you know him, <laughs> when, did you know about him when you were in Denmark, about the whole New Jack and Keith Sweat and the Heavy D and the Hip Absolutely. and the, uh, and Boom. Kumo D and... I knew him the first time I started hearing that sound. The first time I hear the sound of hip hop collaborating with R and B was Al B. Shore. Okay, you know that's Kyle West, but Teddy is actually involved in that record too. I've, just I've interviewed I've it. interviewed Kyle West. I, Kyle West one of my good friends. I love Kyle, and he talked about you know Teddy in the studio and that's watching him and stuff. So yeah. So your first time you... And I don't know if you know, yeah. Teddy Riley also did uh, Doggy Fresh, the show. I didn't yeah, even yeah, know yeah, that. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he, yeah, he was... Um, yeah, the whole din in the net, the whole Inspector Gadget stuff. And yeah, yeah. The whole t -t 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 yeah. Keeping the flow going. So trust me, you know, as soon as that... When Albie Show came out, I was on. I was on. And when Guy came out, it was over. You know, but yeah. all his remixes, everything, I studied. I, we can talk about Teddy from now. I need to get a bottle of wine or something was in yeah, chat from the you fire. can go ahead and do that <laughs> i i'm obsessed with teddy riley Obs i mean he was the sound he created it was so spectacular and it was up in harlem in his little yeah. room up in harlem his, where his studio was and what he did up there is insane and he did much more than he even got credit for because yeah. you know, the story he had the story of gene and, gene and everything yeah took all the credit and all that stuff yeah yeah, I mean, oh. being in hip hop, then did you know about say Kumo D when he did go? I, I go, I get the job done, even for the, the, the um, um, Big Daddy Kane. I, go I, see I, the doctor. Go That's see the, the doctor. Yeah, yeah, I work. Um, I, he did I, the heavy I, D in the boys. I know everything. I had everything, all that, everything. I was, and that's why I'm still in Denmark. You know, that was what's so amazing was if you were into hip hop in Denmark, especially when it wasn't popular to be breakdancing anymore, <laughs> you were into it. Because, you know, there would be no other reason to be into this because it wasn't popular in that sense. So, you know, we were the the, the, the ones who were into it. We knew everything, wow. everything. And Teddy in particular, yeah. I studied so much as a producer. You know, I mean, just incredible. Let me just turn my phone off over here. You know, <laughs> incredible. Um, the amount of inspiration. And 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 Colin, my my keyboard guy, you know, I'm, I'm the beat guy in our team. I cannot tell you. I mean, back then I made cassettes like after cassette after cassette. Going, you got to learn these chords. I don't <laughs> know what he's doing every time. He got these in it that just sound different. His chords, and he goes, "Wow, they really expanded his chords." And I go, "I don't know anything about that, but can we get that on our records?" You know, <laughs> so we studied Teddy like beyond. He's probably the ones we maybe. Jay Dilla and Q-Tip or Twilight or Chris and yeah. then Teddy Riley. Those are the two biggest books for me and Colin in everything we did. Wow. I mean, uh, one of my favorite albums. Like really two big ones there. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite albums is the Make It Last Forever Keep Sweat album. And the first song on it was um, Something Just Ain't Right. And it starts off with Teddy with the keyboards. It just starts with an intro of the keyboards before it goes into <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. And the way he plays, that's why my favorite parts on on the his records were Teddy's Jam. Okay, Teddy's yeah. Jam on the first guy album. Yeah. And Teddy's Jam on the second. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. So we yeah. Would listen to that over and over and over and over again. And yeah. then I just could not understand how he got those snares to pop like that. And it's not until recently you kind of found out he used the 909 drum machine. That was kind of like a house drum machine at that time. I don't know if you know, I'm too nerdy now. No, no, but no, no. You tell, there's lots of people who listen to that and understand. Okay. And that snare has a really hard pop. Yeah. But it also has a very distinctive sound. So mm -hmm. if you use just that snare, you will sound like all the other records who use that snare. But Teddy used that snare underneath his breakbeat snares. So if he would sample whatever funky drama or, you know, he loved the. Um, uh, God make funky that snare, you know, he, he would all same, but, but he would have the 909 underneath, and that's what gave it that whip. Mm -hmm. And then it was a, a board called SSL that everybody probably knows if they're yeah. working in the music industry, but the SSL compressor. When you take that that combination of an 899 and the breakfast, then you put that in through a compressor, and you get that. And he always flammed the beat. He'll have a clap in front of it a little bit, so it would flam a little bit. Don't get this started. No, I, no, no, I no. Him so much. <laughs> no, no. You know, because they, as a fan, starts an inspiration. Yeah, as a fan, that you could, I could always tell his 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 drums or his, uh, oh, his yes. keys and 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 everything there. Absolutely, yes. But to think that he he did this. So you think about your upbringing in Denmark in in a, in a rural farm area. He was in a in a projects. You know, had no money, had a small Casio keyboard, and 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 but had all that talent. And and then learning how to do this in a studio, that just shows you that actually when there's talent, it doesn't matter where you're from. It just it's just in it's oh, just in you. So true. But we used that. Uh, Eric B and McKim had that line. Uh, it's not where you're from; it's where you're at. Yeah, it went that became our mecca for us Danes <laughs> because we were really. Out Outsiders, you know, like you know, when we showed up, and as I said, you know, in, in today's culture, it's normal. But that back then, and then we came with an accent and wearing shorts, flower shorts, you know, like <laughs> we looked. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we went into the studio and people were like, you know, I remember we had a session with Patty Labelle. This is kind of early on, and we were starting to buzz a little bit because Latifah had us produce a record, four songs on her second album especially with a song called Fly Girl that got nominated for a Grammy and stuff like that. Yeah. And we were like, oh my God, you know, we barely know what we're doing. <laughs> and know so much to Latifah. So we started getting some, you know, remix jobs and we made a lot of remix, Soul Power remixes of Chill Rob G's and Jungle Bros. So we we're buzzing a little bit and I guess Penny LaBelle wanted to get that sound. I think mm. our first big remix was Tony Braxton. Uh, I Belong to You, I think it's called. We did like a kind of roller skate mix, we call it, but we actually sampled the beat from from the Gap Band, outstanding. Okay, that's the beat underneath. But we had the claps and everything. Um, probably, probably shouldn't have said that now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But anyways, um, so I remember we showed up and and I'm sitting in the room and Hedley Bell walks in with her entourage <laughs> versus, and she's like, "Can you get me this and this and that? I need this and also some this and that kind of tea. You need, if you don't have that tea, you need to go get that tea." Like we need it before Soul Shock shows shows up. Oh, did um, you? And I just went. I just got up and I said, "Okay, I'll go get it." And then my assistant said to her, "Ah, that's Soul Shock." And we went through that so many times in the beginning of our career, <laughs> and it really wasn't until Tupac, when Tupac took us under his wings and we started having big records with him. If you work with Tupac, it didn't matter if you're from Mars right. or where you're from. You kind of got, we got the stamp. So after Tupac, it, it, it was kind of like, okay. I don't think people really still knew we were white, but you are the guy <laughs> that yeah, Tupac, right? right? Yeah, okay. Good. You just want to make sure. <laughs> you oh, know? Goodness. So, oh, I didn't realize she yeah. sent you to go get the stuff because she just assumed you were the engineer or so. Yeah, totally. She was she was like, there's no way that that was like, <laughs> no way that that's all shot. Just no way. <laughs> oh, goodness. I mean, how did you guys, do, I mean, you said you um, 
you you you, were, you got into your DJ stuff. Um, now, with your parents being academics, were you still going to school, secondary school, and university while doing the DJ stuff, or did you? Oh, what? Oh, and it was a ongoing battle because you know I just was burning so much for this music, and my dad really wanted me to have some kind of Back up. academic, you know, yeah. education. Backup plan. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear myself actually saying a little bit like my say, I say that to my son. <laughs> and he's like, uh, Dad, please. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, we made a deal and I said, OK, I'll do business school. So I did three years of business school, barely making it because <laughs> I was practicing. And I was in, you know, championships and I flew to New Music Seminar was another very, very famous DJ kind of competition where also rappers were. And that's actually where Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince first gets discovered. Wow. And unfortunately, I was up, Jazzy Jeff was there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was good, but I'm not Jazzy Jeff. No, he's another oh, So you were, you were in the same competition with Yeah, we were, yeah that's battle that you get one time and... That's it. You know, you just, you got to show what you got. It's a knockout round. And I heard from Jeff one in an interview that he was, that he really was ready for battle. Yes, he was unbelievable because we didn't know anything about Transform Scratch. We could do a lot of stuff, but when he did, <laughs> 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 wait, am I going out next? Because if I'm going up after that, I have no secrets. I have no secret weapons to beat that. <laughs> That's just insane. We, you know, we could do all the fast scratching, but that transforms scratch. And I actually think it's cash money. Maybe did it the first time, but but Jazz Jeff, you know, he 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 went to that competition and then fancy. We were like, okay, we're going back to Denmark. Then we're done. Wow. <laughs> Not a chance. Yeah, he was insane good. To scratching, he was insane good, Jesse Jeff. Wow! So, How yo, so? Yo, so I did that, and I yeah. finished my business school, and and as I said, my first try going into the music industry was New York, and uh, we had done a record in Denmark called "Break the Limits," and because we were so good friends with Red Alert, and, and became so good friends with with uh, MC Light and Audio Two and their dad Nat Robinson. He actually put that song, Break the Limits, on on his label, which was, you know, they had like a whole album with all their big hits. And uh, he put our song, and it was crazy, you know, because, you know, we're from Denmark, you know. Yeah. So we, I had a good moment, but I, I, I have to say New York was rough for me because straight from Denmark to New York, it was just, and it was, it was aggressive, yeah. you know, because it was a really hello from the ghettos like uh no one wants to listen to us no one's paying attention the police doesn't even come into the ghettos when there's issues in the wow. ghettos where are they gonna get who are they gonna talk to and rap in some way started becoming very or more political in some way probably yeah. getting start on the on the stage and stuff like that too so it, it you know it was just intense and then on top of that you had to baddest motherfuckers in the world. So you got Premier, Molly Mal, Teddy Riley's coming up. It's just like, wait, <laughs> like, how are we going to get through? And that Patty LaBelle session I was talking about where she sent me out in the kitchen was in LA. And once I came to LA, like palm trees, sunshine, <laughs> I'm not shooting, at least not right here. <laughs> and more importantly, they had one bad motherfucker. They had Dr. Dre out here. Okay. But besides that, I kind of felt we could compete with many of the other ones. Okay. Okay. That's why we settled in LA. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could have, I, you know, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of those who I've interviewed through from New York and uh, from the East Coast, and they, and, they talk about how rough it is in, in, in the East Coast, from Philadelphia to New York. They, they, there is no hiding. So those who have grown up there talk about how rough it is, whether it's in the Bronx or, or, or things like that. They're just coming out of the crack ep ac epidemic. Um, they're dealing yeah. with so much things out there. So the thought that you, you know, I'm, I can't imagine what your English was like. You know, you, if you're British, I could understand. Oh, I mean, I don't super, know the accent. Super. 
heavy accent back then. <laughs> and like a little white boy with blonde. I mean, you should see some pictures of me. You'll be like, <laughs> how did you get know shot? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, but I also loved it, though, because I must say, as much as I felt it was scary, I also loved it. I was, it was, I was now, I had studied all these, you know, record sleeves and, and yeah, looking yeah. at all the pictures. The credits I'm and everything. In it. Not only that, my name is on some of these. It was so exciting for me, you know, and I didn't care about money or and I just wanted to be part of the hip hop culture. So as much as this was rough, it was also amazing. I mean, I got had some amazing moments. I was spinning at a club called Club Mars. Uh, it was a very famous hip hop club in the Meat Pat District when it was as rough, not the fancy one you see now anymore. <laughs> you don't really see any of that stuff that we saw back then. It was great. Wow. 42nd Street was crazy back wow. then. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I was Hell's Kitchen was Hell's Kitchen. That's the wow. best way to describe it. But anyways, you know, I remember a, a night Q-tip came straight from the vinyl pressing and, and came up to me and go, oh my God, first first trial called Quest record. Can you going to play it? And I go, of course I'm going to play it. So I played oh, it. Oh, so you know Q-tip? Cool. Yeah, because he was part of Red Alert and everything too. So <laughs> Q-tip came, gave me the pressing at Mars and I played Definition on a Fool for the first time. So I had amazing experiences too, meeting all these people. I met JC before he was JC. He was still JC, but driving around in a Mercedes with stickers <laughs> in his car promoting himself. You know, <laughs> you know, so it was incredible, you know. But it was just, it was rough. It was wow. rough. And then times maybe two or three because we were little white boys. We yeah. Really careful. I mean, we really had to be careful, not overstepping our boundaries. Yeah. And you, we had to be fucking good, like really good to compete, you know. So we had to practice so much, study so much, learn. Also, we got into R&B music. We had to study church gospel music because a lot of the vocals are very inspired by that. We need yeah. to learn all the runs and all the stuff. So, you know, we studied everything and were very humble, very yeah. humble, but also competitive. <laughs> you yeah. have to be hip hop culture. That's kind of part. If someone said to me, I'll be like, "Well, let's get on the fucking turntables and let's see what you got." You know, you that was you had to have a little bit of that hip hop attitude as well, or else you just get rolled over. But I did find coming to LA a lot easier. So before you get to LA, were you? Um, so because I'm what is strange to hear is that I, I you know if the if Latifah and 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 Jungle Bros are going on tour around Europe you would always assume that they needed their own DJ because if they mess, if a DJ messes up, it's on them. So why would well, they hey, trust? Hey, hey, hey. I was third in the world. Okay. They had the DJ. <laughs> but didn't they have their own DJ back? Could they not travel? Oh, I be, well, I became her DJ. I, you know, so Latifah, I became, we did shows in America too. You but know, that, that was in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so did, Latifah, did she have a DJ before she, they came she to had, Europe? He just had, you know, uh, Mark the 45 kid, but, you know, he wasn't, you know, DJ in that sense, you know, by the way, he passed away recently. So oh. RIP to him, you know, he did the 900 number, stuff like that. I, I assume you know who that yeah. is. He's a legend too. And he wasn't really, he was more producer DJ. He couldn't do all the scratching and okay, stuff like that. Okay, okay. You actually had to be really fucking good because you were right. Uh -huh. When I took the way we performed with Latifah and Trilogy, it's me extending the beats. And she goes, I want to do a breakdown. I want to do, do funky drama. And she's rapping. If I mess up. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. She always mess up. So the reason why they picked so good DJs, it was because technical, we were a band. Mm. And we had to be uber good. So I think in way what Red Alert saw, if this guy can stand on his head and run around and, be, and do cutback, whatever, he can definitely hold the beat. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, there were some nights where I had to DJ for Jungle Bros too, for Sammy B sometimes, you know, if he was sick or something like that. So I had a couple of nights where I was DJing for Jungle Bros. And yes, I looked like I was the coolest guy in the world. I was pissing in my pants. <laughs> I mean, fuck, I need to, my, are you kidding me? That I better get that over there again. And that needle better not skip because 
they are rapping right now. Oh, and here's a drop. And I got to get in again. Okay. You know, so it was really intense on us DJs. You know, now you you see the DJ more who maybe do some live scratching, but it's all recorded on programs. Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. Tape, the CDs came out. But back then, we were in vinyl records, and sometimes we wouldn't even have an instrumental version. So we would have to make our own instrumental of some of wow. the, you know, Wrath of My Madness. We didn't have an instrumental of it. That was the TV. So I had to cut the beat. That was, I had to extend the intro. So she could yeah. rap. Well, she would be rapping on herself. <laughs> Maybe that's why you guys make really good producers, like you know, because that sense of being able to the creativity and the innovation that you, you that you that can. and then also when you when you're in a club, like for example, when I was spinning at Mars and I had the hip hop room, and I got six, seven hundred hardcore b boys from New York in mm. front of me. Let me tell you, we have no idea. Yeah. And I that, that helped me to reading the floor. And I think that's another thing DJs are thinking of good at. We, we've been at clubs where a record doesn't work. Mm. And, you know, you know why that doesn't work? Because the bass, the 808 sounds like it's like, I mean, there's no bottom in it, man. How, what, what, how am I going to play this record? It might be a dope record. But whoever mixed this record, I can't go from pump that bass to this because it sounds so thin. And, you know, I'm not going to mention who that was. <laughs> so, but they had records that sounded very thin. So you learn. You also learn, oh, that intro really works. People want to hear that one more time. Okay, maybe mm. just drop it so it's twice instead of only one time. So I'm reproducing in some way the original record. Yeah. You know, so I think that's really where producing came in, was also working and knowing these rooms in yeah. front of and learn how, what, what, what you could do to a record to make it work. So when we did our start doing our stuff you know hopefully people will notice we got beats mm. we we had hip-hop beats you know on our song with monica before we all got a lot our life you know when that beat drops in you know that was one of our big ones that's typical us we would be like oh it's a little pretty song and then oh. yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. No. Before we get into the, the tracks and stuff, I, I, I guess how did you meet yeah. Colin? Then did did he did you meet him in Denmark? Yes. So you know when I came back from New York, um, EMI. This is after the, the shooting. This is after the shooting. This is after the shooting. Yeah, I'm back home with mom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm like fuck this shit. I can't do this. <laughs> okay. Then uh, we had already got so much buzz and, you know, we were in the press in Denmark because we were Grammy nominated for Queen Latifah and Denmark was like, what? Wow. That's, that's the rapper from New York. Yeah. What are those two from Unborn <laughs> and Hartwick doing with Latifah in New York? So we got offered a, a record label in um, by this guy called Michael Rizzo, who became head of, head of EMI Records in Scandinavia. Because now the Danish artists wanted that hip hop sound. And so we started remixing all these rock bands who had been laughing at us. And we started putting, and Soul to Soul had just came out. Doof, 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 yeah, doof, yeah, yeah. Doof. Okay, we'll put that beat on because that beat is really originally from Bismarck and Big Boobas, you know, mm. they, that the jazz just sampled. But hey, it was genius what he did because that became a whole new trend. Mm. Um, and um, and then we we spent two years and we we did some Danish bands with this band called Cut and Move that got signed in America, whatever. Just, but I after we had tremendous success doing all these Danish acts, but I had been in New York. Once you <laughs> been in New York, you beat it to the mecca, the That's it. Trail. <laughs> when you when you it's like when you when you uh what did you guys when you tasted what is that Nando's? Yeah, that's the place you have. Yeah, yeah, Nando's. Yeah, you can't go to someone called Nando's. Yeah. You know, no, I want Nando's. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, so that was what it was. So, I remember after two years, I just said we, we got to go back. And we were originally it was Soul Shock, Cutfather, and Colin. The original team was Cutfather and Soul Shock, and then we went to America, and it was so rough. I mean, even LA wasn't rough in the sense we got shot at anything like that, but it was impossible to get our tracks out into the a &R system. You know, even though we've done the Tifa and John of us, you know, all the really heavy executives are still like, cool. You know, we couldn't get a meeting with the assistant to the a person. 
Wow. You know, so cut five to six months goes, I'm going back home. And I just, I just felt, uh, we're better. We're better. I hear the music coming out. I'm telling you, Colin, right now. We're better. You know, we're not better than Jimmy Damn Terry Lewis or Elaine Babyface or Teddy yeah. Riley, but we're better than, and I'm not going to Yeah, you, you got some, yeah, yeah. Many yeah. other ones. And uh, I just said, if you, if you, because he wanted to go home too, and I said, if you, I promise you, in six months, we're going to have a top 10 program if you stay with me. And we did. Just before I asked what the record was, but <laughs> what, what, what about the the opportunity you have you had back at home? Because not a hundred percent. Who apart from um, um, Brian Abrams from Call Me Bad? Every other my guests have been white, a black, and they've talked about <laughs> bad record deals and and how they got shafted <laughs> and stuff like this. Here you are telling me that EMI says, "Hey." Here's a record deal. So we're going to bring you partners. And and so then all of a sudden it means that you have a different understanding about the industry, about contracts from a very, even from a very different, from an early stage. So that, did you understand the opportunity you have was not given to anyone? I mean, well, only first of all, what an amazing thing for you to catch on what you just said, because that's actually incredible. You, because you are so right. I knew nothing about anything it's like scratching and i think i think you know what we had accomplished denmark is a very small country it's only yeah. six million people you've mm -hmm. got two guys who was nominated for a grammy for someone for queen latifah that's on the that's on your main nightly news wow we interview yeah so and plus hip-hop music even everybody said it was going to die and go away no mm -hmm. it grew and grew and grew and Europe made their own little funny version, snap or whatever they were called. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah. You know, yeah. like hip hop and, and you know, and and Mantronic, Curtis Mantronic, you have to pay some respect for him too. Yeah, you know? yeah. I had Brian Wilson. Yeah. Came to, to an England, you know, Derek B. Derek B, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, we had that Nina Terry. You had yeah, a number of people. Yeah, Nina years. Terry, Buffalo Stance. As a matter of fact, the record I did in Denmark, the rapper was Nina Terry's little brother, <laughs> CP. Okay. Yeah. So, so it was coming in Denmark, soul to soul, whatever. So, and there were no one else than us in Denmark that had put out records. I mean, you put out records in New York. Yeah. So we were kind of like, whoa. So everybody was trying to get us to make these beats for them because that was the ultimate in Denmark. So it wasn't so unusual for us to get that in Denmark because there was no one else doing it. Where I can understand New York, I can, if you take artists and stuff like that, blah, blah. But the point I'm really impressed that you picked up on was, yes, this was an amazing opportunity for me to learn the business. Mm -hmm. And I was so green. I remember the first act we signed was this girl, Yasmin, and we actually ended up signing her to Geffen Records in, in um in America and CJ McIntosh actually from from your country did a remix of that because see CJ McIntosh I remember he was also around DJ mm -hmm. you know and he was also in those competitions um I don't know if you remember him um but then uh I remember having a meeting and we're talking and the artist goes or the artist manager goes look I'm I'm like the head label head okay <laughs> I'm sitting with a cap on and you know public enemy t-shirt or something <laughs> and uh, and he's like, what about publishing? I said, let me just, um, I'll get right back to you. Just give me one second. I just got to take this phone call. And I ran down to Michael Ritter, who was head of the company, who, who assigned us, who was giving us this record. And he goes, what's publishing? <laughs> and he goes, just say, yes, we take that too. <laughs> so I knew nothing. So those two, three years running a label, were actually amazing. It really gave me a lot coming to America, getting into the business. I didn't. I wouldn't say I knew everything, but I had a big understanding of royalties, yeah. copyrights, publishing, publishing shares, and as a producer, you get your mechanical royalties and you yeah. get royalties from producing. You know, I, I, all that stuff I knew when I came back to LA. I almost feel in some sense going back home from New York to Denmark was like a let me, first of all, recover from what mm -hmm. happened 
and maybe learn a little more, go a little more in the studios because we were in the studio every day with a bunch of Danish acts and we couldn't care less what they were talking to us about as long as we had a beat. I remember one point we had a sample of a big payback, you know, James Brown. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we just, that's going on the song and the guy who was the producer of, or the band member goes, well, we're not in that key. We're, that's a major. We are in a no, That's a minor. We're in major. And I go, change the song. We need to get that guitar on. We were just brutal. We wanted hip hop. <laughs> you know, we just, it wasn't even about the songs, but that snuck up on us too. And that's coming later. We'll get to that part. Yeah. But, but then, as I said, then I just didn't, when you taste the Nando's. Yeah. Yeah. Nando's. yeah. Well, so I mean, that's really good that you actually had that opportunity to learn all all that stuff because, you know, you can't you can have the fame, but without the fortune, it's almost pointless. You know, it's, yeah. it's you know, the uh, Jodeci. When I interviewed them, they were like, oh. we were selling all these records, but we realized we weren't making any money, and and we didn't understand the business side. And their parents who were oh. their label was also called Bad Boy. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Because you make and they and Bad Boy had a label deal with Uptown, so I, I, they probably got. I can't even imagine how little they probably got. Actually, I feel so bad. Yeah. By the way, what an amazing group, Devante Swing. Let's not sleep on him. No, no. I, I think people, <laughs> I think people forget how much he changed the industry with with R and B with his, his key, his keyboards, his sort of his writing. I mean, they wrote. Forever My Lady, when they were 14 or so, you know, they, he, he was just writing songs with for, for just for the sake of it. Um, but yeah, as a producer, he he was, he's, yeah, he's... Well, I can tell you as a producer, if you listen to our song with Tony Braxton, I Love Me Some Him, love me some you should him, go back. Yeah. Boom, shot. I'm doing a reverse snare to the snare. Where did I get that from? Jodeci. Devante always had a reverse snare before the snare hit. So it would be doom, shh, boom, shh. And that shh was the, the snare being reversed, going, and on lo- I love me some him. I was like, we're going Jodeci on the snare on that one. Wow. So he is another huge inspiration. And Jodeci, I mean, <laughs> when they came in records, it was, tell me. Oh, no, that's not even them. That was actually the other group. Yeah, that was the real, yeah. That was the but Jodeci had so many records that was insane. Yeah. You know, yeah. That was just, an, and they were so bad boy-ish. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that rap look and attitude to R&B. And I think that was Puffy's brilliance. You know, he is kind of the one who really took rap and R&B. You could barely see what was rap and what was, you know, R&B at, at one point. He was just all mixed together. Yeah. Yeah, he did have um yeah, he did have a massive influence on on and I think that was what Uptown they first came out with the new Jack Swing with the hip hop with Aaron, um with um, not just Guy but Heavy D and the Boys and Father MC doing the new Jack Swing. Then they did the, the hip hop so remember Teddy producing Heavy D how I mean how crazy was that? Yeah, like, that first album. Found love, like, all heavy, all yeah. Those yeah, as I said, I, you know, um, yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah, it, and I think the whole uptown, you know, the whole in, <clears throat> introduction into, you know, as I said, hip hop soul. So taking, so Teddy did the new Jack Swing, and then they they took the hip hop soul. It was like, okay, let's do, let's do hip hop with the soul on on it and and the combination. So they took it to another level. Um, it really did. Yes, yeah. But when it's to focus on you. <laughs> so, um, so every time you bring up something, I get you can hear I'm a fan too. Yeah. I'm not just producing. You no, know, I've been a fan of hip hop and R and B ever since I was thirteen. You know, twelve. <laughs> but, but and I think it's good that people see that because it's important that they understand. Because as I said, those people who might think, oh, he just he's just coming in and taking our stuff, to understand that actually you in Denmark are listening and DJing. I don't think many people would then realize that you actually DJ for Latifah. So you've got a <laughs> seal of approval from hip hop <laughs> legends. People won't, won't realize yeah. that. They will just think. So it's important to hear all, all, all of this. And But also the fact that you go to um, LA. Why didn't you guys go back to New York? Did you go to, when you, did you go to New York first, then LA? Well, we, went, we went straight to LA. I was like, we're not going to New York. I, I can't. <laughs> and no, then at was that, that point, yeah. Huffman, 
That's uh, 19. We arrived in uh, L.A. in 1993. OK, so 93 is when I moved to to um, I was in Alabama. So I moved to the States in 93 as well. So oh, that was. Wow. Yeah, so that was ninety three when I moved to moved to LA, moved to the US, um, to Alabama. So I think the we had SWV just with their coming out with their type of music. We had oh, the, yes, did we? Yeah, Boy, um, did we. we 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 I think we 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 were getting um yeah, so I mean New York hip hop was um We definitely had Jodeci. Jodeci too was was yeah. I mean Puffy definitely was I think Biggie might have started around ninety three. So yeah, so Maybe. in ninety three, um, he he came out with uh, Flavor and Year and the Biggie stuff in ninety four. That ninety three, he um, yeah, Jordan, he, he, yeah. So that ninety three, we 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 were yeah. just we, we you know we had and that's what I meant. Not now now in New York, you had them as well. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like you know, there it just seemed like every competition was in New York, and that what that meant was it was hard to get meetings with the record companies because we would be way down the list. You know, I mean, if you got like, you know, the, all the producers who are currently making records in New York and that was a closed scene, yeah. they're going to be ahead of us. So it was just hard for us to get in. And we also just, I think we needed a little bit of peace, honestly. I mean, <laughs> New York is really hectic, man. You go down the street and it's like, and you go into studios, everybody is just going crazy in the studios. You know, I remember when we, when we, we always flew to New York and made records, you know, like, you know, I remember a session we did with Silk, did a song called Hooked on You. Mm. And you know, every room next to us, it was, I mean, Buster Rhymes was coming in. Was that the this. Hit Factory or what was this? Yeah, it was. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I can imagine because um, everyone I talked to who worked out of the Hit Factory, it's either, you know, even Teddy talks about, you know, Q-Tip having a room and he needed oh, yeah. a room for Michael Jackson and Puffy totally. pretty much took over half totally. the place. So I can, can imagine how congested it would be just to try and get you to get into the studio <laughs> to get into the studio yeah. too. Okay. <laughs> okay and i think la yeah. would, would have been yeah it didn't seem as if much was happening in la recording wise i mean you really uh, had dre nwa and of course you know warren g or whatever but there was just it was more a south central um you know west coast hip-hop scene that was had his had had that when it came to like the whole R and B hip hop scene, yeah, we felt we were gonna take over. Honestly, we we felt very confident in it, like you know, just with the people that were there, and it and then we did very fast, you know. But we needed to learn one more thing before we could go there. That's what we're talking about songs. But I don't know if you want me to go into that. Yeah, 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 go ahead, yeah, yeah. yeah. But when we came here, you know, we started like writing songs. But I was obsessed with the beats it was all about the beats man you know <laughs> and Harlan was doing his keys and then oh there's someone singing oh yeah cool we're, we're, we're just making beats here you can you can just sing whatever you want to do kind of thing and I remember we we, we knew if we want to get into the ultimate ultimate level we needed a meeting with Clive Davis <laughs> the godfather so we worked on it and we worked on it and we worked on it and we finally got a meeting with Clive Davis and my first meeting with Clive Davis was at the Peninsula Hotel here in LA because he would come out here all the time. And again, when he was in LA, there was less people to see. I mean, mm. Puffy would still be here and whatever. And when Clive was in town, everybody would just kind of like get together around Clive. But I remember coming in and meeting him for the first time and we played three songs. And I'm like, man, he's listening to every song all the way through. We're in. And when he was done, he looked at me and goes, that is possible. The three worst songs anyone has ever played me. Wow. And I looked over Colin and he goes, thank you. You can, you can leave now. And wow. we got up and his assistant, who was Keith Naffy at that time, said to us, before we were walked out of the door, he goes, Clyde wants to see you next month. I go, what? So we walked down the stairs and we go in the <laughs> studio again. I'm like, okay, I think I think we need to I need to think a little more about what's on top of the hard <laughs> tracks. Okay. Because <laughs> you know, in rap, it was kind of like you just like you just follow the rapper. You, you know, you didn't really 
you know, you yeah, they would just spit, and then the hook would just be like, you know, you know, nothing would just say, you know, we do a little <laughs> sample, and you know, so we did three more songs, and we had another meeting. This was the S Peninsula Hotel, also, and um, we come in again, and it was kind of weird because David Foster and Ellie and Babyface kind of was, they walked out and stuff, and I'm like, oh my fucking god, <laughs> and. Uh, so we played three songs, we played all the way through, but now I'm not, I'm like worried, but I'm like, okay. And he goes, you know what's really fascinating? So I go, no, you know, how is it possible to come with three songs that are worse? <laughs> and I'm like, this motherfucker. <laughs> what? And I walked out and Keith Nabby goes, Clyde won't see you again next month. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here, man? What is going on here? So we went down. I think this is where, you know, make or break it kind of thing. He was yeah. pushing us. And before he left, he said, let me play what I'm looking for. And we'll play a Tim Wilde song. Alien Baby song. Especially Jimmy James had lose an Alien Baby face. They're songs. Mm. Amazing. And he did say, if you really want someone to listen to your beats, make a good song. Then everybody's gonna hear your beats. So he did plant some seeds in us. And at that time, I started dating Maxi, you know, from Brownstone. And we had just been in the studio with them, and I just saw her, and we just fell in love and became like we were just soulmates from the moment we saw each other. And um, and uh, we, we went. I had a little house, and Maxi was kind of living with me. And we had this songwriter coming up called Andrea Martin. Oh, and man. she was, Maxi was from Guyana, and Andra was also from Guyana. So, or her, some of her family members were, I think. And so Maxi was cooking Guyanese food and totally different vibe than we normally would do in a session. And Andra's like, doing and Colin is sitting up there. He always had these, you know, he would listen to all these like Toto and uh, all these bands. I was like, what are you listening to? <laughs> But actually, he starts playing these chords and he does some changes that are unusual for an R&B writer. And they write this song. We go to Clive. And now he's at the Builders Hotel, always a bungalow eight. I'm sure you've heard that from other people. <laughs> that was mecca. And when we came there, Prince walked out, casual. Casually, oh, hello, Prince, again. Maybe we're just not meant to be here like this. It's just too high <laughs> level. Like, and we go in and we press play, and he stops after the first song. We have three songs again, and he goes for one second, and he goes, "Roy Lott, I need you to go in the room with Soul Shock and Collins' manager. We're buying this record right now on the spot, and I need they're not leaving until they sign the contract." And I'm like, "What?" And that was before he walked out of my life. And he said, I have a new artist called Monica. And I want her to do this song. And he goes, and if you just listen to me, you're going to have your first number one. And we did. But the story is not quite over yet because we walk out of that bungalow. And guess who's calling? L.A. Reid. He goes, love this record. We want Tony Braxton to record it. I'm like, fuck yeah. Who cares? Monica. Who knows? Then no one knows who Monica is. So I'm like, yeah, we in. So I go to the studio the next day, and I was at the studio called Skip Sailor. It's like a hip hop studio in LA. And Skip Sailor, the owner of the studio, comes running into my room and goes, "Fucking Clive Davis is on the phone for you." And I go, "How do, how does he know I'm here?" And Skip goes, "How does he know me? I'm my recording studio." But you should you should run. And I so I run out and I pick up the phone and he goes. This is Clive Davis. I go, yeah. He goes, you will record before you walk out my life <laughs> with him. And you know why? I go, no, because I'm fucking Clive Davis and you won't work in this industry if you don't. <laughs> you did Monica. <laughs> but L.A. Reid was signed to Clive. You couldn't. No, they actually hadn't. They were, they were, they were messing around with each other. But they hadn't done that official merge. Le but face? That's, yeah, the face was still in Atlanta. This is very early on. We did um, this is when Tony Braxton did still live. They might have had a 
labeled deal, but they weren't yeah. like Aris in the face. No, no, they weren't the Aris said no, yeah. so, but they were this. So Clive gave them their deal. Distribution, that, maybe, or something yeah, like that. It was kind of yeah, like, yeah, like he, yeah. It was definitely still competition between LA and Clive yeah. song. Oh, and the, it oh, happens the, again later. Yeah. yeah. So although although so, LA but, would tell you that um because especially when the Tony Braxton says she wanted money, they they did say, look, Clive gives us gives us the money and we put out the artist. So I'm just, I'm just, I did did LA know that he, Clive wanted the record? Because I can't imagine he would have said he would have asked you for it if he knew that Clive wanted it. Well, he didn't know it because it was yeah. right after we had just stepped out. Yeah, if he know, I but don't think let he me knew. tell you one thing. Yeah. LA called me afterwards, was furious at me for not giving me the record to Tony Braxton. Even when you and told he, him that Clive asked for it first? Well, I, I said, well, he, I said Clive wants it. He goes, I want it for Tony. I don't care. Oh. So they still had, you know, the face like, was still 50% their company. You know, yeah. They were not necessarily budging. And, you know, LA didn't talk to me for like a year and a half. And it, then next time it happens, it's Heartbreak Hotel that he wants for TLC and Clive wants for Whitney and Clive wins again. So me and LA, yeah, we're very good friends today. Don't okay, worry. Okay. No, no. But then, what was different about how you came up with that track then? So that's what I, you know, Colin, dun, 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 that's kind of a little more classic R&B, but then he starts doing these changes, leading chords going up to the hook, which mm. was very more something you would hear in the to total world mm -hmm. and that kind of world. And and then I, you know, I came in with the beat, the second verse is so hip hop. It's from this whole break beat, the static on again. So it's so dirty. And I think I, I'm i scratching It's Yours with Tila Rock. It's somewhere in the background, too. It's so hip hop on top of these chords. And then let's not forget Andrea Martin. Oh, she wrote the lyrics. She wrote the song, the lyrics, yeah. And I think the whole vibe also with... Uh, Maxi nice. cooking food, and I learned a little bit in that session. Okay, if we just sit with our headphones on and just are wanting of our beats, we won't make those records. We got to put our focus on the writer mm. and the song, and we really learned that from Clive Davis. That was really where we it clicked for us that yeah, pay as much attention still to your track. But when you're in with a songwriter, they deserve all attention and deserve all our focus. And that's the only way to write a good record. And, you know, Babyface is the master of that. You know, he, he'll just sit right on a keyboard before he barely put a drum on, mm. you know. So that was the, our learning experience was that, hey, it's still the song. Yes, that's a dope beat. Hallelujah. But the songs that we really get attached to in our life is really those songs that are special. And yeah. that's the song. That's the lyrics. The so, lyrics. Yeah. So it, it, we had, and being Danish, it wasn't that easy just to. With the English oh, language, yeah. Yeah. You know, it wasn't our main language, you know. Yeah. You know, so, and there was a lot of stuff we had to learn, you know. We really had to learn that. That's when, I think, after that record, it start, we start just going, okay, we, we got it now. We understand the attention we have to pay to the songs on top of our beats. Can you talk about uh, we, we lost Sandra Martin um, yes. uh, recently, um, but I don't think. But we lost Sandra Martin recently, but I, and I don't think she got the credit that she deserves as as a songwriter um, because. You know, she she wasn't uh, you know in front of the cameras like say Missy or, right. or Diane Warren, yeah. And you you're talking about knowing her as a you know as almost like a family member, uh, the way yeah. you describe that that session. What was she yes. like? Um, so for people who have you don't know her, who maybe know of her songs, but what was she like? Absolutely, one hundred percent, one of the most talented song songwriters we've ever worked with. And singers, mm. in case you don't know, she's the one singing on that house record, Show Me. Yeah. That, you know, Robin S. There is no Robin S. That's Andrew singing that song. Yes. I didn't know it either until recently. Yeah. But definitely find out when you hear it. Now you know it's Andrew. And Andrew didn't even, you know, she was so sweet. She was so humble. And she just let that happen. 
Like they take her demo vocals, put out a re- record called Robin S, and has someone strange. Millie girl Vanilli, hearing. whole Millie the whole Millie Vanilli stuff. Yes, it is before Millie Vanilli, I think. No, maybe after. Yeah, yeah. probably. But anyways, yeah, that's that's Andrew singing, and you know all. Many of our big songs. I love me some him, Tony Braxton. That's that's Andrew as well. Oh, so then she, how did you how did the working relationship happen? And did you would you have which would would she didn't write something or would Colin and you play something and she would write on top of it? Or how did it then know, work? She, she, she would just come in, and it was always chaos, and <laughs> it was just beautiful. But we we had now learned to really pay attention to them when they walk in and treat every person that walks into the studio as the most important person when you walk in. Mm-hmm. So you don't just sit in the corner and do a beat or whatever. So we just started having fun. And you know, one thing with me and Colin, we, we really have this sarcastic European humor <laughs> that they don't necessarily get in America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, many times, you know, some engineer would have the hi-hat really loud and Colin would be like, should turn off the hi a little bit, and then we'll turn it up, <laughs> and we'll be like, no, 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 okay, <laughs> you know. So, but but Andrew had our humor too, so we just had so much fun. And most of the times, it would be Colin sitting with some chords, mm. a little bit like bass, and her humming, or I would have put some beats on, so it was more like a track already, mm. and we would just put three, three, four, five tracks. And she would just go, that's it. And she would just go in and she would just write the song on the spot. Wow. Like in the room. Like while she's figuring out the melody, she's writing the lyrics. I love me, I love me some him. Who we'll just who we'll would just sit there going, What is going on? Like, you know, she was so incredible. One of the most amazing wow. talent songwriters. You know, Clive Davis did sign her and he did try to put her out as a solo artist. Mm. You know, I don't know if there, there is an Andrea Martin. There wasn't out yet. It wasn't out yeah. yet. Yeah, but it didn't. And yeah. maybe, maybe, she, yeah, maybe she was a songwriter. That's okay too. You know, maybe yeah. she was not an artist. You know, it's, it's not necessary just because you write good songs that you're an artist. You know, we see mm. examples of that all the time. Sometimes mm. it is. But yeah. a lot of times it's not, you know, Sean Garrett, amazing songwriter, his solo career didn't necessary. But then you see sometimes a Neo. Okay, yeah. that worked. What makes the difference? You just know now. Many things. Yeah. Comes into, yeah. So, but then did you and Colin then start to write the lyrics as well? Then how, what did, what, how did you then start to get more comfortable writing the lyrics and thinking, feeling more, comfortable with, with what you were writing and producing? We started like paying attention to having concepts. Um. And it sounds boring, but we we realized if there wasn't a concept, then it would be hard to get people to remember that record because mm. even though it would be a bunch of beautiful words, if there wasn't a story or concept where that line ties it all together. Mm-hmm then it's it's hard to get that impact. So we we would always give all the top writers all the freedom in the world. We would never go in and nitpick in the process because we really believe in, it's like a painting. When you paint, if you go in and say, I don't like it. And the guy goes, well, that red you don't like, it's actually going to be green. I'm mm. about to put blue. You know? Like, so you've got to kind of let them go through the process. And Harold Lilly, who's one of my really good friends and I one of my just, mentors in this uh, business too. He wrote all the stuff and like stuff like that. And he always says, trust the process, mm. which is just let them do that part. Even though maybe you can hear something, let them, you don't know. And then when you're done, you go, you know what? I think, you know, we need to come up with a line that's kind of like that punchline that, yeah. you know, at the end of the hook, you know, you say that line and kind of go, whoa. Yeah, it's about yeah. a girl it's not even about a guy or you know or something like that you know yeah yeah yeah. so that's that's the way we have done it more i'll say colin like for example heartbreak hotel got really involved in lyrics um but i you know really our main thing was to give them space and then once we were going there we were going now melodies we got very involved in and that's i think being scandinavian 
you know, why are there so many good Scandinavian pop producers? You know, you have Max Martin, Mark and all Martin, these yeah, yeah, yeah. Pops and, and I think one of the reasons is when we grow up, our first time we get attached to a song, we don't know what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. We're six, seven years old, but we like the melody. Yeah, yeah. So you most can, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, know Ace of Base, Abba, you've got Stargate, uh, Stargate, Stargate, Stargate you know, yeah. You know, oh, I love Stargate. Yeah. Friends of ours. Yeah, they're so sweet. Yeah. And they're, they're so thankful for us. They feel we paved the way. They always, when they meet us, like, you're the reason why we. We even dare coming over to America. Wow. You know, so we have a great relationship. Yeah. But, you know, it's because, so melodies is another thing we that we go really hard melodies. Mm. Really hard melodies. So I think it's a combination of things, but always respect in a studio or not. It's not never ego. And no one is necessarily right. We just open doors. And trust me, when something is the best, we all know. It's yeah. pretty simple. But always open different doors to see what's in each room. You want to try to rap there? Sounds like a horrible idea. But let's try it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, why not? We'll spend half an hour. And then we'll confirm, okay, there's not supposed to be a rap there. You know what I mean? So I think that's one of the things we, we've also learned that, you know, really kind of the, being in a studio, writing a song is also, you know, you're a therapist. <laughs> I sometimes have a therapist in the studio, you know? Yeah. It's part of it's a big and a lot of the new producers coming up skip this part. Mm. You know, they just on because now it's all on online and on um, computers. Yeah. And when they go into the room, they just sit there like they do at home. And it's like if you don't pay attention to that singer right there, you're not gonna get a good song. And it's it's good that you say this because uh, when I interviewed um, Bob Robinson from Tim and Bob. He, he, he said something that Jimmy and Jam and Terry Lewis did, and this is when they would say they're working with Tamir. They said, he said, they said, look, what's going on? What do you want to, let's be part of this. You know, say, give us some ideas of what you've been up to, and then we can write it, build something from this. So that it's, you feel some ownership Wait. in this. So we know what's going on oh. with you. So, you know, Jimmy used to say the same when they did the Control album, that they, they followed Janet around and, and she talked about her dad trying to take control. They, she talked about um, when it took it, some wow. nasty boys were talking to her and she was like, these nasty boys talk to me and that. I didn't, why didn't you help me? And they created a song based on this. So that's, that's what Jimmy said. He said all these things, the whole album was based on just having a conversation with Janet and having her talk. And then they just created a song. So when you were saying about paying attention and letting the artists come in, that was what the greats are doing. You know, Tim and Bob and, and Jimmy and Terry making sure that they actually, it becomes, they're involved and it creates a more long lasting song that isn't sort of force fed on, on, on us. That's it. But, you know, we do that too. We're first, every session we have, the first sometimes two hours is <laughs> just talking about what's going on. It's just, you know, getting to know each other. You know, how are you going to go in? And, you know, the, we see some top lines who come in and they have like four sessions in a day. And we would just say, if you just had one, yeah. you would write a great song. But that's also the way it works right now. But Jimmy and Jam, it's funny you bring up Jim and Bob, Jim Jam, because Jim Jam also told me another thing. I remember when we had some of our first hits, and I was sitting next to him uh, <laughs> at some Clive Davis party, whatever. And I would be like obsessed with like what chart position my, my song. <laughs> and Jimmy just looking at you and he would, listen, all that energy you were spending right there, put that in the studio. Mm -hmm. Do the best you can in the studio. And once you're done and you know you've done all you can, you let it go. And whatever happens after that, it's out of your control. We're producers. You're not marketing guy. You know? And and I really like that because it takes attention away in a session, sitting there finding out what songs are blah 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 and all. Focus on what you're doing. And yeah. our job is in the studio and we love it. The one thing you keep talking about is what's your relate how was what's your relationship with Colin? Um because I, I I listened to Jimmy talk about his relationship with Terry. There was no contract. They're they were they were they're more than brothers and more than friends. It's a partnership and Ella and baby Everyone faces. Contract. Yes. So how was it with with Colin? Because you you talk with him so just glowingly. But he's just incredible. You know, he's just incredible. I will say that you know, we had we had a long, 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 we had a lot of big records, seven or twos and Whitney Houston's and all this stuff. And and I remember around two thousand, Colin was done. 
he was worn out wow. from having to deliver hits. And it's what comes with the territory is we start getting paid a lot of money. <laughs> and we will get a lot of money up front before the song is written. I loved it. <laughs> Let me buy a Porsche. <laughs> Great. But what you don't realize in that young phase of your life is you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting a lot of money for a song that's not even written yet. And we, when they paid us that kind of money, like when R. Kelly was on an album or L.A. Bave or us or Timberland or whatever, that was singles. That's where all the money went. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't write a good song. A good song wasn't good enough. No. They were expecting a number one record. Wow. And that catches up with you, and especially yeah. Colin, who had the long hours in the studio sitting with every songwriter. So I remember in 2000, he literally, we had a session with Kelly Rowland. He goes, I don't feel like doing it. And I go, uh, I don't either, necessarily, but they paid us already. We have to do it. He goes, I don't want to do it. And I'm like, wow. So he took five years off. And uh, I was all of a sudden by myself. I was sitting in the studio. I remember I came to my studio. We were down on Sunset Boulevard. And I was sitting at 10 in the morning and I said to Max, yeah, I'll see you where we would be home for dinner. Yeah. I didn't want to tell her yet, you know, and I just sit in the studio and I never turn on the light and at like six at night, I'm just still sitting in the same seat. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And I, in those five years, I managed to get by. We actually, actually wrote the biggest record I've had in my career, which is uh, Pitbull and Chris Brown, International Love. And I wrote that with, uh, or produced that with a guy. I always like to work, work with people. I don't like to work by himself. I did that with a guy called Peter Bigo. But but I missed Colin so much. And when Maxie, when I lost her in 2015, um, he came back. And um, and thank God. Wow. And we started working again. And we, you know, we're just brothers. When you've been through, when you accomplish something like that together, I don't think you're ever going to lose that bond. Unfortunately, I see a lot of people breaking up. Yeah. I really think that's something to do with your ego, too. And I think with me and Colin, you know, listen, he knows I can be this and whatever. I'm the driving force of our team and whatever. But he knows little Carsten Chuck, which is my name, <laughs> inside, you know, and he's still Kenneth Carlin. And it's Kenneth and Carsten. From, I'm from Olbo, and he's from Olbo. And that bond will, if you can keep that sincereness in a relationship, yeah. probably goes for marriage, too, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, then, then you don't lose, if you go on an ego ride and you buy a Porsche and say, it's okay, maybe you do it together. <laughs> but you also have each other. When sometimes when you are like, the cool, I, I love this house, I love this 100 inch flat screen I have. But why am I not happy? You know, mm -hmm. and and him and I just since we've known each other so, it's the same thing I have with Maxi. You know, before when we met each other, she, uh, if you love me, hadn't been released yet, and I hadn't had any hits yet. So that's also the sincerity we had. We knew our love in you know, and I, I guess you could say the Colin too, whatever our our respect for each other was sincere. Yeah. So you know, I just you know, when people go through those, I'm so sad when people break up and stuff like that. I understand you need breaks and stuff like that, and you also need separate lives. But yeah. I think in me and Colin's case, yeah, I mean, he's he's so talented. Yeah. I mean, the guy is crazy on those keyboards. <laughs> yeah, but but as yeah, I mentioned, I started off by talking about being a therapist, and and part of why I do this was to really highlight that actually those within the industry, um, as famous and as rich as you guys are can still struggle with mental health. So for Colin, I can imagine why he would yeah. step back because the pressure and, 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 and you know, if, if depression could sink in. There's a lot of self-esteem or anxiety and you need the break. And most people don't, they try and power through it. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's important, especially as men, we, 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 we think we, you know, we're macho and stuff. So it, I'm glad at least he was able to take that step back um but then and, and he's the guy who's teaching me that side I, i'm more than macho alpha whatever but he's the one that constantly he's more spiritual and he will you know he he will just know if he calls me i'm like Arr, and i'm like, like <laughs> what happened did you run out of coffee like did the bagels not show up like what's going on 
Yeah. So, you know, we just have, he's such a gentle, beautiful soul. And I think he, he knows me so well that he can always, and just like I can help him, you know, but that spiritual side is, is definitely um, him that's, and that's, I think that's why we're still together. That's his really, I would give that his credit because, you know, definitely when we were, had 10 number ones, whatever. <laughs> I was, woo! I was, I was flying. I did not see many things around me. I was just on top of the world. And wait, wait. you know, thank thank God to have someone like Colin as a partner. But you know, because I bet if I had some new American partner, whether also be both Danish, whatever, yeah, people yeah. keep things a little grounded. Even though grounded at that time would be still out of control for a lot of the people, you know. <laughs> Then think about it. you got called by Clive to write for Whitney, or did you have the track and then he said he wanted to? What how how did that the really Heartbreak Hotel? Because that's I love love the Faith and Kelly and oh, right? that's, that's it's just the that's an R and B right? and it yeah. and it, it is well, it's, it's five, not uh, yeah. Go ahead. I was just saying that you had these power singers who didn't bring too much power to it, so you could like. We could sing along because you know Whitney and Kelly could just take you up there, but they were like, "No, we're gonna keep it slow keep it cool. and faith." Yeah, well, faith we've always just, did. Yeah. Even on uh, "I Love Me Some Him" with Tony, Tony can go there too. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Tony, we always were. We liked it a little, a little sexy, a little cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. that story is crazy. We wrote that story. That was actually we we, we signed with EMI Publishing and Big John, who was uh, an A and R person there. He's now head of the company, but he had this new writer. I got a brand new writer, and we love New Town. We have had so much success with New Town. Monica, Jojo, who was like oh, only yeah. twelve, we didn't leave get out. <laughs> um, you know, no one knew who he was. We loved him, and so this was a new writer. And we and her name was Tamara, and she came to the studio. It was her first session. And this girl writes Heartbreak Hotel in her first writing session. But I remember Colin being a big, big drummer. So this whole record was done. And I came in, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to do a beat. Now I'll, I'll kind of let a little Timbaland thing going, yeah. you know, <laughs> going crazy on this. So I just loved it so much. And um and we just went to see Clive and we had this record as one of all the records we had. But we kind of knew we had a hot one. <laughs> and so it was a bungalow eight one more time. And Wycliffe was there and there's a big party going on. There's always so many people there. And again, back to your point and, and what we talked about earlier, Clive, when you walked into a room, he paid full attention to you, even though it's five days. And even though Wycliffe was sitting there, whatever, if the meeting now was over with Wycliffe or Prince or whatever, and it was social Colin and no one knew, we got the same attention. He understood uh -huh. songwriters, how important they are. They are the ones and producers that makes his machine go around. And he and is the king. Mm. Okay. No one touches Clive. You would break your angle for Clive, you know, without yeah. even understanding. But anyways, we played Heartbreak Hotel the first song. And that, at that time, Larry Jackson, who's now head of Apple Music, instead, he was Clive's assistant. And um, that was just the... I mean, he Clyde just stopped the wagon. He's like, "What the fuck?" You know, he was like, <laughs> and he knew what he was about to say, and he said, "I think we should do that with Whitney Houston." And even though we had worked with Tupac and Tony Braxton and Beyonce, whatever, or, or Destiny's Child, Whitney, <laughs> it just. I just didn't get better. I mean, we were almost nervous. And funny enough, the same thing happened. L.A. Reid writes a call two days after, I want to do the song with TLC. Wow. And we had to say once again, no. because <laughs> And he got pissed off and uh, asked one more time and didn't talk to me for another two years. Oh. You know? <laughs> but how did he hear the song? Who, who's leaking it out? Because we have a match that just sends out songs. Are you leaving? Yeah. Okay. When are you going to be late? No. Okay. Uh, I love you. <laughs> Sorry, that was my son. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> oh, so they'll send it out to different labels. Yeah, to yeah but, you know, and but then Clyde would always call in for meetings, which meant sometimes he would be a little bit behind because Clyde wanted to hear the songs in person. 
And also, you had to bring the lyrics. He was obsessed with the lyrics. He would sit with, if you didn't bring the lyrics, you didn't want to hear the song. Okay, you had okay. to sing, sing the lyrics, and, and you played him the song. Wow. So, LA had heard it in, in theory before him, and we had to turn him down again. You know, so it is so funny with the LA. Anyways, we're going crazy. And he goes, You're flying to Miami. New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey, okay. Because we, you're going to record it at Whitney's house. Whitney and Bobby had just bought a house. Keep in mind, this is after Bodyguard. She is on top of the world. She's just sold 33 million singles. Yeah, how can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> of I'll always love you. So we're flying to New York and we're at the Waldorf fancy stuff. <laughs> and again, baby face is there, David Foster. We all stay. And I keep seeing David Foster and baby face coming back every time they go to see him. We, we were waiting to go work with her. And uh, I was I said to Kenny, how did it go? He goes, so, yeah, I didn't get into the house. What? I didn't open the gate. I go, what? And he finally comes back today, like, we're leaving. And, and, and Babe says, good luck. And I said, what's going on here? He goes, you'll find out. <laughs> Bobby and Whitney, they're, you, you're about to find out. So now it's our turn. So we drive to New Jersey, to this crazy rich area in New Jersey, with these mansions and this gate that's like four times as big as my house. <laughs> and all we heard was, Miss Houston is not ready to say, okay, back again. And we did that again, and again, and again, and again. And on the eighth time, now I'm just chilling in the car, eating, you know, <laughs> chips and stuff, and playing on my phone, and not even, barely had the equipment we needed, because, you know, we still back then needed a ton of equipment. And we're coming out, and I'm like, Miss Houston is not ready. Miss Houston is ready. Shit. <laughs> And the gate opens, and I'm like, oh my fucking God. Shit, did I did you bring that, Colin? Did you bring the meaty thing? Did you bring the you got the emails? Yeah, we have it. Okay. Shit. Okay. We go in. And I'm a little nervous. Even though I work with all these artists, I'm a little, I'm not gonna lie to you. And we get up to the house and Robin with like her sister. Yeah, Robin, yeah. We show you the studio. We walk into this crazy house. There are so many people. So it's his, her mom was there and Everybody's eating fried chicken, and I'm like, oh, great. It's like a Thanksgiving dinner almost, like whatever. And okay, let's go. I'm in them. It's just a lot of assistance, and someone running, oh, did, we eat? did you get her dress ready? And <laughs> it's like shit, and we're going to this room, amazing SL9000, brand new, like 120 channel. I've never seen a studio like this. Incredible. Wow. And so we're waiting for Whitney, and I, kind of an hour go by, so I go to Rob, and I said, you know, so where is Whitney? Is it like, upstairs or? She goes, honey, let me show you where Whitney is. Come with me. We walk out this huge house and I'm like at a golf course. And at the end of the golf course, there's a castle that's like bigger than your, and she goes, that's where Whitney is. So she bought two properties. One, the neighbor house was the studio. And then her castle was where Bobby and Whitney are. And we, she has barely said this before I see a golf cart coming. And I kid you not, Bobby and Whitney coming up in the golf cart. Bobby's holding a <laughs> ball of Tennessee. The golf cart is swirling like this. <laughs> and Robin goes, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> go, oh, my sure God. I am. <laughs> so... Here comes Whitney Houston. And Bobby comes and says, what? Okay, we're going to do my album first. You know, I love you guys. I love that song you guys did with Tupac, whatever. I got some demos and whatever. <laughs> and then Clive said to me, Clive said, whatever happens, do not get Bobby on the record. He's on every song. Let's go, go play it. Let's go, let's get ready. And I'm like, well, okay, all right. It's probably fine. Okay. We go in and then Whitney came and I'm telling when I stood in front of her, I was little Mr. Carsten from Olpo in Denmark. <laughs> I, was this I could not even look at it. I mean, it was fucking with me. Houston, man. And she goes, hey, how's it go, honey? And I'm like, <laughs> I love the song. Thank you. Thank you. And Bobby and 
and her are just doing a lot. <laughs> and she had what's called tea breaks, where she would disappear in the bathroom. <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything else, okay? I'm just gonna, <laughs> well, I, I'm gonna stay, stay in the studio. And she came out, and she goes, okay, let's go. And I'm gonna be like, okay. <laughs> and she goes in the booth and she starts singing on top of Harvard Joe. And it is horrible. Oh, horrible. Wow. And the song is almost over. And I'm sitting in car and sitting, I go, I'm not fucking telling with you something it's not sounding good. And he goes, You think I'm gonna fucking tell? Him? I'm not gonna tell him. No, way, I'm gonna tell Whitney just to sound good. The song stops and it's just quiet. And you know, I just sit in the talk Danish. She goes, What's going on? And she comes out and goes, Hey, listen, you wrote this song. I didn't write anything. It's your song. Just tell me what you how you want me to sing it. It's okay. And I said, Well, you know, it's kind of like it bounces. It's like it's kind of like double tempo. She goes, I got it. She goes in, worst take. She goes, done. Bobby, let's go back to the house. He goes, Yeah. He goes, I'm coming back to do the rap pot tomorrow. And I'll take it. And here we are. Phone rings. Clive Davis on the phone. Did it? Did you get? You know, it's important you get the best vocal ever from Whitney because you know I'm putting two other song singers on, so it has to be like she has to be better than them. How do they go? <laughs> good. They went really good. Went really good. So we're coming back the next day. Now faith is rolling in, and faith. I mean, I don't know if you have ever interviewed her. And not she yet. Was, not yet. I mean, she's just the most amazing, sweet, incredible. Yeah. Just want to hug her. And just, she's so amazing. Her voice is so incredible. Yeah. And she was going through a lot, I think, with Biggie and stuff at that mm. time. So, which was okay, because we like when people are a little bit moody. Yeah. You know? yeah. And she went in and we cried. I mean, but she her, sang. Oh, and she nailed her parts. Like, you know, we still didn't really know who was doing what yet. But we knew for a fact she was going to do what's called the pre-hook I think mm. you call it in England. Because she, the way she just sets up the hook, no one will ever. I mean, we were just going crazy. And we just came out, we hugged and talked. And we were just, it was, and then Kelly comes in. And Kelly is just ripping it. It's like me and Kyle were like, oh my God, we need to turn down the recording signal because she's blowing up every tube in the studio. She was just like, whoa. And we were like, <laughs> <laughs> just ripping it oh. so now and, and again wonderful and faithful there we're all hugging kids now it's six at night Clive's calling I was on it goes oh my god Faith and Kelly sound amazing I don't care <laughs> how's witness sounding I go I'll, I'll get right back to you on that one and he goes is, is Bob Brown the record he goes well Bobby's kind of doing this is the heartbreak oh he goes what did I tell you Get him off the fucking wagon and get Whitney to do that part. And I'm like, how? Oh. <laughs> but this is where, as a producer, you got to understand all you kids who are starting as producers. It's on you. Wow. The producer, Quincy in the studio, whoever's in Teddy, it's on us to get it to sound good. There's no one else. Mm. There's a record company. They don't do this. There's an <laughs> artist. They hire you to sound the best. Okay. So I'm calling the house. And I said, Robin, I, I really need to talk to Whitney. She goes, no, I don't think it's a good time right now. And I go, I'm, I'm really sorry. I really need to talk to her. She goes, okay. And he, she gets to go, what's up, honey? It's perfect. Isn't it great? And I say, you know, I really would like you to hear it. No, 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 honey. I love what I did yesterday. It was amazing. I said, okay. And I'm like, my mind is racing now. And I go, well, here's the thing. I just got off the phone with Clyde Davis. And he wants you to approve this record. And I'm not allowed to leave the studio. And I want to go with you. But I can't. I can't lie to Clyde. You need to come listen to the song. And I knew Clyde. The fear. Yeah. You know, Clyde, she goes, oh, God. It's typical. <laughs> well, we're really busy here and stuff like that. Like, I know. And here they come again. You know, the cough guy. And Bobby is up. I, I mean, <laughs> love him to death. I mean, please don't. This is not negative. No, no. We all we've animal. seen the stuff. We all know. And Bobby's yeah. admitted, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she comes in, 
And I had I no I don't want to give her speech about anything. This is fucking with Houston. So I just sit down and, B- and Bobby goes, oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> and I said, you know what, before we go actually, you know, Whitney, I see that you and Bobby are so much in love. Why don't you do this part, the Heartbreak Hotel together, like a couple? She goes, that's kind of cute. She goes in and she goes, this is the Heartbreak Hotel. No, I don't like it. And I'm like, that's good, that's okay. I got it. <laughs> so that's just the one line I'm looping the whole, through the whole song, because I got to be on top of Bobby. Okay, one pop of salt. Here's the big one. I go, okay, I'm just gonna, you, can you sit here? She goes, no, I'm fine over here. I said, I think you should sit over here. You sit in front of the speakers. And I press play. And Kelly is murdering. And Faith is an angel coming from heaven. And here comes Whitney. And I just let her hear herself. And I just stood there. And I could see, okay. Something is going on right there. And when it was over, she was totally quiet. And Bubba goes, okay. She goes, Bubba, shut up. And it's just quiet. And she goes, okay. And she goes, Rosalie, I need my uh, track suit, the pink one. Uh, Robin, I need my inhaler tube that t- for my lungs. I need this. And we're switching the microphone. I know the microphone we did on I Always Love You. Yeah, I want that microphone. Also, get my second engineer in here right now. And we're going to switch out the, the, the setting in the vocal room. And I'm like, okay. Okay, she woke she, up. <laughs> she took her, she took everything off and like put the, her like track shoe on. Like she, that she normally, I guess she has like a whole spiritual thing. Yeah. And she goes, are you guys ready? And we're like, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> And she went in and she murdered it wow. for like three, four takes. And she sweated. So she, you could really tell she was going through. This was the beginning of her going through some challenging yeah. moments. Yeah. So she killing her, you know. And it was just, you know, but man, she gave it all. I mean, her wig fell off. I mean, it was, she was, she gave everything. And she came out and we all just hugged and danced and, and was so happy, but you could also tell how hard it was it for took her a lot. to sing on that level. And then we had a puzzle after this. I hope it's okay, because one of my favorite records we did too. We had just had all the ad-libs and everything on an MPC. So everything you hear, ooh, yeah, this is the heartbreak. Ooh, this is just me sitting, punching in. I had a Faith page, a Kelly page, and a Whitney at the page. And Every athlete you hear in that record is just put back in on the record because we couldn't control the amount of singing we had. Yeah, to, wow. We had a page of faith with all the best athletes, Faith to Kelly, and every every athlete you hear is just put punched back in into the song. Wow. And it came out. And and I had this is the heartbreak hotel. And I could almost not get her no away, but I had to chop it really tight in the end. So wow. I could just loop all the way through so we ended up saving that record and i'm so proud of that record so you you, you couldn't keep uh, how would bobby have sounded with it <laughs> well i have a version if you want to hear it <laughs> yeah, it would have been great to hear his part of it <laughs> you, you, you didn't want to keep it for a remix or something <laughs> well not uh, clive davis was that that was not a proof <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, I learned very early on, if it's not approved by Clive, oh, wow. then you don't. <laughs> wow. You, you know what? I think, you know, we've seen the film, um, I Want to Dance with Somebody. We saw the Bobby documentary and we realized, no, so it's nothing a big secret. But I think, I think I've heard Kelly talk about when the, that actually when they did perform that, it felt as if Whitney had to take it and a, a notch up. Because she thinks he really, yeah. Really hard for her. And, you know, I think, I mean, for me, and I, I'm going to go on record saying, I think she's the greatest singer, female singer of all time. Yeah, yeah. I know Aretha. I know, I know I get it. I know. But for me, she's the greatest singer. And and I think, why must, I just feel the, the vocal on I Will Always Love You. Yeah. To this day, I don't even understand it. And I'm yeah. a producer. I don't even get it. The way she's breaking into falsettos and to the power of holding it's and and having emotion at the same time too mm-hmm. and that goes for many of her records too even them how will i know it's pop but it's also she sings it's so emotional yeah. 
So, you know, for me, she just, you know, it's, in my generation, she, for me, she's just all time greatest yeah. singer of all time. And I really think her lifestyle really, it, it was real. It's like, you know, if Cristiano Ronaldo doesn't practice and sit in his and run in water and yeah, yeah. God knows what he does in snow or whatever. I mean, this guy's, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. But you know, that's why he's at 38, even though it was laughing. Well, he's still the one who scored the most goals. Yeah. This year. You know, okay, yes, in Saudi Arabia, but 54 goals, it doesn't matter yeah. where you're playing. You know, I mean, that's pretty, of course, you know, but still in the professional league. And I think you just got to keep it up and you see it if to, to reference football. You see it in players. Mm. Eden Hassad, why are you done at yeah, 30? Yeah, yeah. He, I'll yeah. tell you why. He came to Madrid, you know, now, now we're talking football. Yeah. You come and you're overweight, whatever, and you think at 30, oh, I'm just going to train for a week. Mm. No. Your body. Yeah. It's, it's not the way you, you know, you can't get it back. And I think Whitney was at that point and you saw it because we worked with her on the next album too. Yeah. We, we we never we couldn't finish a song. I, we flew to Atlanta, and I almost don't even want to share too much of this. But she showed up, and it, it, that was not good news on that song. That was not good news. At this time, could you use auto tunes, or was it still? T- no, we didn't t- have auto tunes. We we would we. I mean, I mean, with Faith and Kelly and Whitney, you didn't need, of course. <laughs> just no. But we know actually on some of the other songs, the first time we used auto tune is on seven oh two. Oh. And we actually use it so much that we get the share effect, you know, because we have heard that share record. So mm. if you listen to Step Two, we, we 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 crank it up so you can hear this auto tune on because you get that robot feel. But no, we didn't have it. I mean, back then, but with faith and I mean, nothing I had was not in pitch. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. You know, yeah. nothing. These these were, you know, and that's what Clyde wanted to show. He wanted her witness to be current. He wanted to bring in the he wanted to keep Funny enough, he wanted to hire the white boys to get the urban record. He wanted the R&B, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he really wanted. He didn't want a pop record. He really wanted an R&B record. And we had done so many R&B records. You know, we many of our records are really R&B, not because yeah. we thought about it, just just what we loved. Yeah, we that's all we wanted to do. Every time I remember, Clive calls in and said, "I wanted to work with Ace of Base." We're like, "No fucking way." No way. He goes, are you crazy? The biggest fan in the world. I go, no interest. He goes, you know how much money? I go, I'm not in this with money. I want to work with R&B and hip hop. Don't, don't call me with this stuff. <laughs> See, so, you know, home. we were really living this, you know, and, you know, and also, you know, I have to say being around Maxi with Brownstone, that's a really serious R&B group with some harmonies and some gospel and stuff like that. I was around them all the time. You know, I really got to understand and Maxie took me to churches. And stuff. I mean, I really got to understand the depth mm. of these vocals. Yeah. It, it just so, finally, what, when you took the record back to Clive, I had did, did, was he surprised with the finished product? No, that's what he expected. <laughs> he he just not listen to it. He's like, he goes, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't think I have any changes. I mean, I mean, we got paid. I won't even tell you how much money you won't believe it. <laughs> so much money to do. We were so on top of the world. So when you it's like when you buy a Ferrari, you know, when it drives well, mm. it's not like you go, oh my god, it drives amazing. It better fucking drive amazing. You just spent five hundred thousand dollars on a car. You know what I mean? And I think when we came with records, Clive looked at it as like, you know, of course, of course it was perfect. But, it, but I enough- think maybe deep down he, he knew. He knew it was starting to be tough. Yeah. And she was also smoking a lot of cigarettes yeah. besides weed and everything else. Um, you know, and you can your vocal cords mm. and her lifestyle, and they, I mean, really, I can definitely say they were living it up. Yeah. Me, you know? I, I, and I, yeah. You know, when you sing, the amount of actually, uh, you know, Lung capacity you need to have mm. to hold these notes, and and right after, uh, ooh, you got to go back and sing a verse. It's not like it stops. Yeah. Then you add on to it live on stage. So I can imagine when you talk to Kelly that she would be like, she probably could tell this was hard for her. She really yeah. had, to, really had to get herself up on that level and get herself up on that level wasn't easy with with all that that's she, happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. How how proud was it when they out the song went to number one? I mean, it, it, it it's an 
it was Whitney, uh, one of my favorite Whitney tracks because oh, I know she has the power, but it just felt like just a vibe. And I said, I love how faith just the harmonizes through that and 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 everything. But how satisfac satisfac satisfactory was it to this all the story you've just told to see how we all received it? Like, wow, this is awesome. Unbelievable! The first time we, we we got flown out to New York and and Clive Davis is introducing the new Whitney Houston album. I I gotta tell you, I I I I I, I couldn't believe I was there. I, I I just felt this this can't be true. And I'm sitting, you know, hey, oh, Rodney Jerkins, night, okay, hey, <laughs> Jim, hey, Jimmy <laughs> Foster, hey, they're all sitting and. And here are the producers. Of course, we don't white boys except very <laughs> and, and But I really, I got shy, really. That and I just, I, I just couldn't believe I made this record. I, I just, I was stunned we achieved this. And 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 when I saw the reaction and everybody, I was just, it was kind of weird because I didn't really know what to do after this because I don't think we could ever beat anything no, but, yeah. there's nothing higher so you know there was michael jackson but this is kind of also when michael a little bit you know he's done dangerous teddy yeah. Hill, but you know but that was it was kind of it was a really weird period because i don't know if you can imagine it's like if you won the champions league you know or you waited for your yeah. whole life and it's yeah. almost like that drive that motivation that that dream you had as a little child and you reimagine in your mind and now you hear it, and then when it's happening, you just go, "Now what?" Like, oh yeah, yeah, you know. So we, as much as we loved it, we, we were overwhelmed, and we got so many calls. This is also where Colin starts feeling like the pressure. Yeah. We, he was lining up, and we were booked for like two years ahead of time, and it was wow. just it was. I lost my mind a little bit that period. I'm not gonna lie. I I went through a moment where success just got to me. I just. And I remember uh, Maxie actually. She was like, she she left. She was like, time out. I mean, like you you just you you're gone crazy. And uh, I woke up one morning and I come downstairs and there's like <laughs> girls everywhere in the house and just party all over the house and people I don't know. And I was like, what the fuck has happened to me? And I remember calling Maxie's family. She had moved to London. She did a solo album for Mercury. Mm -hmm. And she was engaged to a beautiful guy called Oliver, who was a great producer in England. And um, I knew if if I didn't get her back, I don't know where I I needed her. I needed her so bad. And I, I was getting a little personal here. That's nice. And I flew to London. And this is because we were working with Craig David. Craig David wanted us to work on his second album. We did great record, you know, uh, Rise and Fall with Sting. And I was living up in Primrose Hill, London, mm -hmm. by the way, loved Primrose Hill. Was in, that was a studio up there. I think it's gone. That's where we did Craig David. And all I was in London for was finding Maxie. Wow. And I remember calling one of her aunts. She finally gives her number. I remember calling Maxie and she's like, no fucking way, not you. And I go, I lost my mind. I It, it, it got to me. I need you, blah, blah, blah. And I had to meet with her and Oliver, who had gotten engaged, the blah, blah, blah. And it was all dinner. And Oliver was so sweet. And he goes, you, you two are soulmates. You know, I'm not going to. And that's when she said, that's it. If I'm coming back, we're having kids and family and no more. <laughs> and so that was my moment in life uh, where mm -hmm. I realized I had, I had also gotten a little bit out of control, you know. So that was a beautiful moment, you know, to realize it. Thank God, you know, yeah. I don't realize it. And I think that's made my upbringing, whatever. So it's funny, we talk about this beautiful record here, all this comes with it, because that is big to be number one in the world. With yeah. so it's overwhelmingly big. And whoever starts producing whatever in your dreams, just remember when you have them, when you achieve them, calm down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, the, 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 because... It's not that you just had a number one record. You've spoken about the trials and tribulations of getting that record recorded. I don't think any of us, because before you you experienced what you did with Bobby and Whitney, all of us know about it now because we've seen it on two or three different yes. films. So it's not a surprise. 
But back then, it, we didn't know about what was happening. And you what? had to, you yeah. would you were paid to deliver a record. There was no real altitude at that time to be able to just take a little bit and, and modify it. And Whitney is Whitney. You can't modify yeah. her voice. So to so I can imagine the we stress. We didn't Pro Tools. Yeah, no Pro we Tools. Were anything. We were on tape. Yeah. So, I, so we hearing, the <clears throat> hearing the story, the pressure of recording, because you, you, I don't think you make it seem, you, you said it, you've sounded it in a fun way, but it sounds to me stressful. And the pressure oh, of of Clive oh, saying yes. you get that record done and and stuff. So I, I, you know, so I I I think I can now understand why it affected you guys. You know, right afterwards, it, did. it really did. Yeah, it did. It was it was it was just it was just it was, almost feeling like I felt like I was living in a movie. Also, like I was just like, and you know, oh, everybody calling and get invited or you know. Oh, Brett Ratner wants to meet you for this new movie. And I'm like, why? Well, because you're Whitney Houston's producer. I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, it's just, you know, wow. You know, it's really crazy. But yes, getting, that's the most important part for, I can give all these producers who are coming up. You have to understand, there's no one besides you mm. to get this song right. So focus in the studio on it because, as Jimmy Jam says, that's what we do and that's all we can do. Don't do it half-hearted. You've got to do it all the way because there's no one behind you. You are the one, if you call yourself a producer, you're the one who is responsible. Yeah. That's right. Wow. And, and as I said, you couldn't even enjoy them being at number one because of the stress no, and everything. Okay. Yo, in, in, in a out-of-control way, I guess you could say, but yes, not necessarily in a, in a happy way. Wow, goodness! You know, you, you I know you, you guys did the. Um, you don't know it's. I, I've I've interviewed Mila, um, almost from from seven o two, and she's you know, and you know, because she has her son and her, and her own drama and and story, um, and seven o two are really a, a a really unique group. At this time, though, um, are you taking less? Are you pacing yourselves? And not doing too many big singles, no. or no, oh, no, we got to, We took all off. We took it all in, man. We did everything. We did song deals all over the world. We flew around. Wow. I mean, it, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. And our management, of course, were encouraging. We're like, can yeah, because you don't know how long money. it was going to last. Just take it and go. Yeah, well, I didn't really think like that. We just, uh, but but that's where maybe I should have paid more attention also to to Colin because I remember, for example, Craig David. You know, sessions, you know, even though we had the best time, Craig David is one of the most incredible artists in the world, but what a sweetheart mm. and what a funny guy he is. He is <laughs> fun. He's the one who introduced us to Nando's, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. But, but, you know, yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, it's really hard to, and I'm sure when I say to producers who listen to this, they'll be like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's really hard to, explain the situation until when you're in it when you are making those big records it really is you know this one guy you know robert de niro is, he has this one saying he goes no matter how much you say you have stay calm mm. that's easier said than done and i should listen to that a little more too in those days too because it's really true calm down you know but your world around you is going 4,000 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. Your phone is ringing off the hook. You're, you know, you're getting offered everything and you just, you know, if you could just stay calm, you know, I mean, I, and then when I say this, people will be, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when they're in it, yeah. it's, it's, it's just really hard. But, you know, I don't want you to think that, you know, this, we were so proud. And so, I mean, it's still one of my favorite records we've done. That yeah. and maybe Two for Love stands out some two of my favorite records we've done. And, um, and so we're so proud of it, but it's just, man, it world goes, you were now on the top. Yeah. Really on the top of, of what my dream was. You know, it's, then you can be an actor or whatever, but my dream was to be a top producer in the world. Well, yeah. that's what you are now. Yeah. And then what's next? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you guys then moved on to work with um, a child star who was in a way looking to leave the industry and that was Tracy Spencer. 
Do, did you oh, feel pre- <laughs> Tracy, Tracy's deep in my heart these days. Yes. Love to talk about her. Yeah. What was it like then when you are working with her when she is probably coming to a place where this industry isn't for me anymore, but I still have to come up with a with a record and I'm and and I'm competing with a lot of other things happening. Man, we could tell. We could really tell. We got hired by Roy Lott, who was used to work for Clive, was now head of Capital Records. And he, of course, he wanted the best producers to work with her. And we were Clive's favorite producer there for a second, <laughs> which is crazy. So he hired us to do the whole record. And I didn't really know much about the story, but I remember one thing I remember was that she won Star Search at yeah. 11 years old. And this poor girl had been through two or three albums trying to remake and all the capital records all of a sudden they took away their urban department but we're gonna keep you <laughs> okay you know so when we met her i remember coming to the studio and she's so gorgeous you know and we walked in and um i could barely tell she that whatever speech i was giving or trying to inspire <laughs> she had heard so many times Mm-hmm. And I remember she had like she's gonna kill me with this. <laughs> I remember she had a bottle of E and J whiskey, and I was all doing my speech, and she's like, mm-hmm. "Okay," and I was like, "Wow, this is gonna be a challenge." And so we took a really long time, and again, Colin is just the master in the studio, and her and Tracy and humor, humor. Okay. We stopped so many jokes about Tracy when she comes to this session, how she would show up, whatever. And all of a sudden, I started seeing a glow mm-hmm. around her. And she started laughing. And, you know, and all of a sudden, when we made vocals, too, she cared. Because mm-hmm. in the first couple of takes, you know, songs, she's singing. And I'm like, well, you know, this. And she goes, okay. And we just tell she's done like maybe 2,000 songs, something like that at this point in her career. Mm-hmm. She's so young still. But we are so proud of that record. You know, we just, you know, she's doing some touring right now with mm. uh, me. So, and I'm kind of, uh, we're talking a little bit again. It's we reconnected. And it's just the most beautiful thing in the world. We're helping her a little bit with, you know, with some intros and stuff for her performance and stuff like that. And we just listened to some of the songs we did. And All About You is a hot record. Mm. It's a great record we did with her. We really are still in my heart, which is Andrea Martin. Mm, okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, that's beautiful to to see that. But that's where you really can tell someone, and also so young. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. It's, just... It, I mean, you know, oh, this is a brutal industry. I mean, yeah. let's, let's not let's not sugarcoat that for anyone who's mm. going this. You know, and I say to everybody, you know, my son wants to be a producer, or is a producer now, doing really well, and it's like ninety nine percent no. Everything you do is no. Send out song, I don't like it. No, it's not going to make it album. No, the artists don't like it. No, the AR people don't like it. Or yes, they like it, but it's never going to get released. So if you're not ready for that, mm-hmm. then you should do it. And, and what does that mean? Well, in my case, I don't care if I worked at a bank or in a mechanic store, I would always make music. I don't know how not to make music. And I think your determination for music has to be that high to mm-hmm. make it because you will make it no matter what. You can't, you know, you can say no and fit. I don't care. I'm still going to make a beat. You know, yeah, like, you know, yeah. you're going to pick why? Because I don't know how not to, you know, so it's, and then the small things you start, if you have success, those have to be recharged in your battery and you have to enjoy it. When you yeah. have a, when you have a, when Tupac came out, we party all night long. Tupac. <laughs> why? Because we need to have all the stuff we went through to get to that point. And now we finally were putting out a record with Tupac, you know? So it's yeah. important to reach out and enjoy those mm-hmm. moments down there because most of the moments, and I think most artists can tell you this, are not necessarily positive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you, it, we, we all know it, it is a, a, a sharky, shark industry. Um, for the artists, from them, it's like everyone's taking their money while they just want to focus on the arts. Um, well, and, you know, unfortunately, when I've interviewed females, you know, the extras, uh, this challenge that they have recording or touring is, is there as well. So 
um it, it's just not oh, an cool. industry that, that that's really safe without uh, for men maybe but then even then you know there is not welfare support you know you guys were going through so much but who was there to say okay do you need a therapist and stuff like that it's like here's more money you're feeling low here's more money and 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 that doesn't solve anything always no it doesn't you know and it's really important you know thank god as i said that i had caught him thank god for my family thank yeah. god for maxi thank god for people around me that i knew were really close to me so it's also so important my some of my friends my best friends are still my original friends so all the way back to my my little town in Olbor, you know, mm. it's still the same friends, you know, I have. So it's so important that you stay connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Person I'm, really are inside, you know. Yeah, so. I mean, I tell my patients, especially the young ones, that the ones who have see have the best recovery are the ones who have have an identity forged within their family. Yeah. So, like your Very son true. now, if he if he goes out, but because you've really inspired instilled in him what it is to be a man and what it is to be yes. successful and things he doesn't then go out and when he's been told no it's rubbish he knows that actually he could work hard and stuff but he doesn't feel that that's a reflection on him because right. he's he's been in things have been installed in him since he was grown up and unfortunately some of the kids go mm -hmm. out and they don't get that value installed from them at home so they go out and find it in in on social media from other people and they get confused they get lost and they do, and that's where a lot of these issues happen and stuff. So the fact that you could be very humble in your roots back from Denmark, so when all this is happening, you and Colin can say, "Hey, look, remember where we came from, remember, remember where we started from, and and then be able to like recharge and stuff." Yeah, you know, I mean, and my mom and dad, you know, I don't have my mom anymore, but you know, still, I still talk to my dad every day. He's eighty-seven years old, actually, turned eighty-eight today. Oh wow, happy birthday! You know, I just. Uh, just you know, it's just really important. You know, when you 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 hear this all the time, and as a young person, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, family, yeah, yeah, friends around you, uh, you have no idea how important that is. It's everything, and yeah. that's also why we're talking about stories from people in New York growing up that doesn't have that security system. Yeah, it's so easy to yeah. fall. Yeah, yeah, it no it definitely to fall back on. Yeah, that but that that's as I said, that's that's that is the big thing that I when I try and when I do my my treatment, I try and let us look at your circle of friendship and family, and 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 I say we need to work on getting people closer to you, before as we're working with treatment because unless you have a nucleus of support, you can fall any time and and no one's going to be there. Um, sure. Saying that, um, you didn't do work on. With Brownstone, we did. Oh, you did. Yeah, we on the second album. Yeah. Or... No, yeah, uh, from the bottom up, it's might be the first album. We did the first album. Yeah, we. That's where I met Max. We when, when it's a very special song because it's called "Sometimes Dancing." Oh, and it's a reggae song. Okay, that's and okay. the reason why Nikki mostly did the lead vocal. But Maxi, because she's from the islands, mm. they want from Guyana and family was all over the islands. They wanted her to do lead vocal. And the moment I heard that, I said to Colin, I'm doing the vocal. And Colin <laughs> goes, You don't do vocals. I said, I know. But in this case, I am doing the vocal. Oh. <laughs> More than to be right in front of her. <laughs> oh. I was so lonely. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I um, I've interviewed Nikki um, last year. Um, and, oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one of the things that I, I loved about Brownstone is that they were, you know, in the midst of SWV, Total and everything, they just had power. Um, Big time. They just had power. But um, I, I, I love the um, five, five Miles to Empty. Um, I just yeah. loved the... The, I, I love the fact that they were different. <clears throat> they, they were and they were different, and the um, harmonies were yeah, the, the harmonies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were one of my favorite. True, they had these big hooks where they. But you know what, Jodeci actually staying pretty powerful too. Casey, he would he would belt too when they were doing their their hooks, and they would stack those hooks a lot too. 
Yeah, but think about a group of Kelly Price, a, gr a group who had Kelly Price three times. You know, it, 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 this is what Brownson yeah. felt like. Yeah. It felt like this yeah. that that type of of that that power. type yeah. of that power. power. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so when you so when she when you recorded them, so did you then develop the relationship throughout? Was that how that did that was change? That was it. Yeah, how the did that change saw Max, that was your it. life then when when you guys got together? Totally. That was it. That we came in and we recorded that in the room where Michael Jackson did Thriller at Westlake oh, Audio Studio. Okay. I remember it very well. Yeah, very special room too. And I just I just remember seeing she walked in, she had these long braids. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. wow. That's not what I see in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just she was so and she had these beautiful eyes and, and I remember I called her the next day and Nikki knew already. She could tell. She could tell in that session, she's like, those two. Wow. That's all. So that's it. From from that moment, that was uh, from that moment I was with Maxi. That was it. We never really left each other in our life. We in and out because yeah. of chaos. You know, then she goes on tour. She almost and she goes number one on RB with you know uh Grapevine and yeah, yeah, Grapevine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh of course if you love me. Mm, you know, and if you love me, yeah, really was big over here, you know. So, so we do, it was just chaotic, and we're young, you know, we're young. Yeah. So I'm so blessed that uh, that we got to settle down together, and at least I got some wonderful years with her, and she was an amazing mom to Nikolai that's still with me here today. Yeah, and I mean, Nikki just um, posted, <clears throat> posted, I mean, I don't know if it's an anniversary or something, it's, but birthday. Just... it's, it's Max's birthday today. Oh, that's why she did that. Wow. Because it is my dad's birthday and it's Max's birthday the same day. I, you know, it's a little heavy for me. You know, it's still a little, it was a very traumatic accident. So, you know, I, it, the whole posting, I just, I sometimes just stay a little more quiet these days. Okay. When I, okay. You know. And I actually didn't realize we had an interview. When I saw that, I was like, oh, but I have canceled on you before. So I was like, maybe that's also awesome. Maya went into the Max's story because she's so much on my mind today. Okay. Okay. No. No. Uh, the um. But then, uh, how, as um. But being a, you know now a dad and stuff, how that has that changed you in your creativity as a musician, as a producer? Does the 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 well, when you had your son? I was saying when when Maxi was here, it wasn't a big deal because Maxi just would she was just made to be mom and she was such an incredible mom that I could go to the studio and do whatever it was just incredible and we would be singing and jamming with Nikolai and I mean no wonder why he's making music by the way <laughs> <laughs> and I would have him in the weekends we would go play football and stuff and I would be jamming all my new songs listen to this new song daddy <laughs> he's on the back seat in the toddler you know yeah great you know he just had music and then you come home and and Max is just singing out of her lungs while yeah. she's cooking, you know. So he had music around him so much. Uh, but when I lost her, which was a tragic evening, but, um, but then I was alone with Nikolai. And I was uh, all of a sudden, uh, I didn't know how to cook or do much. Or yeah. And uh, I also remember going to the studio and I was doing a hi-hat and I was like, this is the most who cares? Yeah. I lost my biggest passion in life. I've lost music. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I took six, seven years off. I'm barely just coming back, actually. Um, and I just learned how to make uh, lunch bags for school. <laughs> and I learned how to cook. And I wanted him. You know when you meet people and they go through a traumatic experience. And one thing was me, but my son, he was home when it happened. There could be some guilt related to that and stuff like that. And um, when you meet people and they're just kind of like, there's something is messed up about them. And kind of their life is in chaos because they never got over traumatic experience. Mm. And I just think to myself, I did not want that at all. I remember I also always asked Maxi if I was in doubt how to be a dad. She goes, very easy. Show him you love him, mm -hmm. then everything's fine. So I 
took by that and I just wanted him to feel safe. So I drove him to school every day, picked him up in school, made lunch every day, took him to soccer. He was a big soccer player, as we call it over here, mm. for many years. Went on the fields, didn't do anything else and took care of my son for wow. five, six years. Didn't make any music. Wow. And I'm sure Colin would have understood because he's had his break. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was he he's part of the reason why we're slowly coming back and we're very excited. We have this new artist, Faye. We think is incredible. F E Y I. I'll send you whatever. We're really excited about. We're developing her right now. We're making music again, but uh, that was that was a, a left turn in life that I did not see coming. Yeah, and then you don't have your. It's different because most of us would have family around, mum, but grandparents and stuff. You don't. Yeah. And and it was and, me and Nicola. <laughs> yeah, you know and, we had to move from that house because we couldn't be in that house. Yeah, and uh, but uh, you know we found this hippie house <laughs> Bohemian. We just kind of we're very close today. Yeah, I was going to say how is he because some ways, it? yeah, and he's 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 incredible. He's just the most beautiful, 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 beautiful son you can ever imagine. So I'm so proud of him, and he's doing so well. And, you know, so it's we're a little bit different, probably. You know, we really are very, very connected. You know, yeah. Uh, Is he so, American? And I'm, I'm, I mean, no, I'm, I actually think he's he's. I actually think he's more European. Okay, I actually do. Like he's been in Europe a lot, and uh, Maxi wasn't that close to some of her family members, and also her dad was in Guyana. Mm -hmm. We didn't see him. She had she had a little bit of a troubled. Uh, relationship so my family became more like his fafa which is granddad and Danish. granddad yeah mm -hmm. yeah and then you know and and more more fun and you know my sister and her two kids we've been on vacations together and family and stuff like that so i think maybe that's and i always we always would marry i mean maxi loved europe mm. every time he came back she goes when are we going next <laughs> and i think if i didn't have my music over here we would have lived in europe uh. I think you you know I think you know as a European you've been to America too yeah yeah I yeah, was there for ten years very yeah. different culture yeah for yeah. good and bad yeah no and that's why I was asking what does he feel American does he feel Danish or a, a hybrid of a, 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 you know he, international because yeah. he's got his mom's side as well yeah totally no he definitely I feel uh, you know if I should judge him he's acting very much like a European kid okay. and his friends you know. Tends to be Europeans or less American, if you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is good. I mean, I guess there's a lot of his dad's influence and stuff, and and it shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, mean, I guess it shows the fact that you've invested in him, where it could be very much easy to invest so much in other people for your music, and then and he almost yeah. grows up by himself. Um, but you've been able to invest in that because. You know, it's not because you're not doing it because of the money and, and you're doing it because no. it was a passion of yours. But, you know, being able to yeah. prioritize him and his and his and his life, that's 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 stuff. Well, that I you think, can never you know, back. no. And, you know, and thank you. But that's that's very true. And I remember he came to me when he was I think he turned 18. He kind of took his hands on my shoulders and he said, I know what you've done. You know, I know what you shielded me from, he even said. Wow. And I just wanted to know I'm OK. And that's pretty big for an 18 year old to say that. And I think also what he was trying to say to me, like, you can start, you can start living your life again a little bit, you know, but how because, that? you know, I've just been, it's just been, it's just been, I've just been, I've just been taking care of him. It's just all I've been focused on for many, many years. But how was that like hearing that from him? What was that like receiving? That oh my God, I cried. <laughs> <laughs> So much. I couldn't believe he could express that, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't even see that coming. You know, it's incredible. So, you know, he's such an, an amazing young man. You know, I'm really proud of him. And he has his whole life ahead of him. And and he's right. You know, we we got through a very, very tragic yeah. uh, moment of our life. When, um, when my wife and I were expecting our first son, we, we attended a course called Two Become Three. And at the end of the course, the instructor says... Think about 20 years down the road. So we're just expecting our first child. 25 years down the road, you're attending your son, your child's wedding. 
and they're about to give a speech and they're about to they stand up and say, my mum and dad, now you've got 25 years to, to write that speech. Wow. So when you said that about what your son said That's to you. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Because he could have said my dad wasn't there. He could have said, but he, he think about what he says when he gets married in his speech, you know. What and, a beautiful thing to put into parents' mind. But that is absolutely amazing to say that. Yeah. Because that's something that's going to stay. Yeah. So I know that everything it is he's going to say. Okay. Yeah. So when you said that he said that yeah. to you, um, it just that flashed back to me like, wow, this stuff is true. Because you've invested and he's acknowledged it now. Wait until he gives you his, 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 his speech at his wedding. You know, <laughs> because... You know, the, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> I'm gonna be crying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because that's that's the one. You know, that's the one thing you you've created that no one can take back from you, and and it's harder work than work recording Whitney number one track, but it is something that you you can still keep working on and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, well, I, listen, I, don't forget, he he's, he he saved me too. Because yeah. when I was most affected by, it, you know, I came home and I found her and, and she was still alive, barely. I mean, it's just so traumatic. It's crazy. Um, you know, when I, I mean, I remember before I went through this episode, people would be calling me and say, I'm depressed. I have a depression. I don't know how to get off out of the couch, out of the bed. And I said, let me tell you what to do. Take the right leg and then the left leg and get up. What's the problem? Let's go, man. Didn't have understanding at all. Mm. And, you know, people say, I've been on the edge. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I've been on the edge too. But now I understand because I couldn't get off the couch. I couldn't get out of bed. But there was a little dude. Yeah. We got soccer. Yeah. We were, we were playing so-and-so today. Aren't you excited, Danny? Yes, I am. You're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And when we're treating depression, that's the first thing we try and do is to get you into a routine. So even though you're feeling low in mood, the fact that you can – have a routine that then keeps it from depression because depression is you shut out shut everyone out you're in your house you can't get out but because you had a, a routine and a chore with your son that meant that it kept you you could still have low mood but it kept you from being clinically depressed because you had to go out and 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 really do something and, and enjoy that and again you know you can't you, you know, and, and, and then I think part of hopefully, you know, with your music going forward could be a way of really trying to get people because a lot of us are going, a lot of people go through this and not as, not to the extent that, you know, you, you, we can never understand what you went through, but to be able to know that actually you, you can still, you can still have a purpose and, and, and your son is really evidence as yeah. to when he told you that, thank you, you've done it. Um, oh, and, my God. <laughs> and also just you know uh, no way am i happy with what i went through but i have much more understanding and compassion for people that i didn't have before you know i think i could be so driven and so ambitious and you have to be to get up at, yeah. on this level it's just part of it but you know, I, now i have a much more understanding if someone says to me i'm not going to make the session tomorrow because i'm so and so i will i won't i will go i totally understand take your time mm. and when i did, say that people were like are you okay? You know, <laughs> <laughs> because it's so far away from who I was before. So in that sense, uh, you know, life has really, uh, really given me an experience where uh, I definitely have grown wow. a lot and much more understanding of people can go through some stuff in life. And it's not necessarily their fault. Yeah. They're overwhelmed at that moment, you know, and they can't see. And yeah. I get it. When it's that dark, you, you know, you can tell, oh, there's a tree out there. I don't see that you tree. Don't see it, yeah. So I really understand it much more than I than I did before I went through this horrific. Yeah. 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 How, how's that changed? Because you said now you and Colin are back and you've got a new artist, Faye. What's what is the, what are we what should we expect? Are, are you guys going more ace of bass, ABBA, or are we getting? <laughs> I'm gonna kill you. No, no, I just don't know because you know I don't know which way, which direction. Maybe uh, <laughs> you've taken no, Clive's we're, money we're... now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we 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 we're we're still doing really, really just incredible R and B, you know, okay. and 
doing some new songs. We got a couple of new placements. We're excited doing a new song with Chris Brown. We're really excited about oh, some of the new wow. stuff. So, you know, we got a song with uh what's the name? Flow Rider. No, that's wow. just the right? flow flow Millie. Is that what yeah? Sorry, okay. I talk, I'm trying to catch up again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we might have our next singles. And so, so we really, I think what has happened actually is that we are more appreciative mm -hmm. of things, you know. And I think, yeah, I can tell me and Carl, I can easily go into the old, mm -hmm. like really hectic kind of thing. And I think that's good to do sometimes. Also, it needs that sometimes you need that energy. Yeah. But there is just a whole different understanding. But musically, oh my God. So short and Colin will always be so short and Colin. Yeah. It will be it will be a very loud snare. <laughs> There'll be some beautiful chords. Yeah. And a lot of dirt on the bottom. <laughs> but then the industry has changed slightly. The music has changed. RB isn't has. as as, as yeah. prominent on the radio. So how are you guys adapting to that then? Are you going more hip hop? Because that seems to be on the air or pop or what I mean, how are you guys able to to have a, a voice because a lot of the other big producers aren't really getting the placements as you would you would have been getting back in the nineties and two thousand. And you know what? That's okay, because I think there's a new generation coming. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we're so blessed. We sold our catalog. We we don't have oh, we goodness. don't have that pressure of financial. We don't have a financial pressure anymore, so we can make music because we want to because we love it. But one thing I've noticed though. I think the music business has gone through this transition where MP3 is coming. Whoa, we've got to adjust to that streaming. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And then you go have meetings with AR people and you were talking about a song and they go, Well, how many uh how many views on TikTok? And I said, I'm talking about a song. I'm not talking about <laughs> and I actually think I actually I was with Larry Jackson only like a couple of weeks ago. He's starting this new company, um, Gemma or Gemma. And um you know, he, I feel, and I was just on the phone with Mark Pitts today, who's one once RCA, mm. uh, does a lot of urban stuff. He was and, with Bit Puffy uh, back in the day, yeah. Oh, yeah, he actually, Mark is the one who found Biggie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you know what? It's coming back. It's all about a song. Mm. It, in the end, all this, yes, you can make sketches, stuff like that, and you can get a lot of views. But if you take an influencer with a lot of views on TikTok, and we've done that in the music business and try to make an artist out of that. Very rarely does that actually work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're kind of coming back to, I think we're going to go see some great new music coming. I feel this great new music coming. Mm. I love Sisa. You know, I think she's incredible. I think there's some great new artists. I love a lot of the rappers. I love Lil Uzi. I like Gonna. I think there's some great artists out there. I think RB. You know, it's coming, you know, we have your summer walker, kind of a little more mumbly kind of thing. <laughs> you know, but it's it's gonna come. It's gonna there's great, there's great music being made. Toy Monet, you know, there's many great new artists coming. Mm. They are just going through another period than we were. Back in the days, we could write a good song, we could get on a major company, it'll be an AR man who will help you make your album as good as you can. That has kind of disappeared because everybody can just upload their music. Mm. So now you have a situation where there's 100,000 songs being uploaded every day. Wow. Think about that. Wow. So, of course, it takes us a little longer to get to, well, Drake, we know, he's always going to be fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, but, but anyone else, you know, it just takes a longer time to get to that piece. But I think in the end, and I see, you know, where some of the music business people that I'm talking a lot with, you know, executives, where they're going, October London that that um, that uh, that Larry signed, you know, I think is a great artist. I think it's going to be amazing. In the end, it's still the same. You've got yeah. to write a good song. And when you skip that part, and and I think that goes for hip hop too. There's so many great hip hop artists. When people say, "Oh, the artists were much better in the '90s in hip hop," I disagree. I think you know we had amazing. We had an, an LL Cool J or Bismarck and Big Dead Kid, but we also had. <laughs> yes. other ones, you know yeah and just like we don't do now we got future we got amazing artists you know we got travis scott we got little baby don't tell me that's not an amazing artist it's an amazing artist mm. they're just as good you know and we'll always have different levels so i think in that sense i don't look at music now being worse than it was but yes 
it's a lot to process now. So where we used to only have selective, you know, artists, and it yeah. was great because they were cared for so much before the songs were released. Yeah. You and if you tell me, okay, all the kids are discovering music of TikTok, you always start in the wrong place. That doesn't mean you can't hear a song that's dope. But think about that. A song is dope. Mm. It still has to be a good song. And I think well, I think we're gonna come around and see a great, 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 great new way. I think it's gonna settle in. I think it's gonna be great. I'm not worried at all. Music and good songs are always gonna win and great artists are always gonna get through. Yeah, I think for us it's the the big thing is that are we we missed the nineties when there was a lot of R and B singing about love before we walk out yeah. of my life, heartbreak hotel. So these were relationships and heartbreaks. We're not I mean, Summer Walker and Scissor and all these guys, these girls are singing about relationships in a very different way. The men aren't really talking, and rapper and, and hip-hop aren't really talking about love and relationships as they once did. There's a lot more, you know, about um, bling and, and, and money. And then women are almost becoming like men when they're singing. And I think that has shocked us. Like, whoa, you know, we had from the 60s, 70s, and 80s and 90s, Love was the core message in R and B, and that seems to have been changed slightly with what we're seeing now. And I think that's more so some of our dissatisfaction with the kind of music that's out there. Is the message doesn't seem to be as in, as edifying as it once was. I, I I do actually maybe disagree a little bit because okay. I do feel a lot of records are still about love. Now, it's true you listen to, of course, a hip-hop album that's going to be just like it was back in the days. It's going to be a lot of bling and show up. That's part of hip-hop. It's just R&B has gotten small. It's really what it is. You just don't... It, it use, I mean, what really is the big difference is that in the 90s, every pop radio station played R&B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that today's artist, except SZA, because I actually will take her out of the other category, I think she is above. I wow. think sis is un fucking believable. Wow. I really think she's an amazing artist. I think she's just as good as some of the best artists in the 90s. You know, but of course the sound has changed. And I think she's daring in making a flower power album kind of thing. I think that's great. You know, and I think we go through when you just name 60s, 70s, 80s, 80s. We had, we had the Luther, the Freddie, love. we had the Anita oh, Baker, true. we yeah. had a lot of them talking about yeah. relationships and yeah. um, even Anita yeah, Sade, the, the group. There, there was yeah. the, the yeah. Freddie Jackson, you know, the, yeah. the, you yeah. know, so the right. it, was, it was the content of the lyrics. Right. Um, yeah. And, and and that was what, as I said. Right. I, yeah. But I think it's just because we don't have, you know, R&B doesn't have a lot of focus right now. I think it's, yeah. it's going to come out really feel it's coming i really i can feel people i think maybe we just need maybe we needed a break from it it yeah. was so big in the 90s yeah you know? it was, it was yeah, all, was all r&b it was, every song was r&b even like the rock bands were trying to put a you know <laughs> so, so beat on in. you know yeah, it was yeah, crazy yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So i think maybe I, I i just i just sense i see a lot of new upcoming artists i feel it over here in america i feel r&b is going to come it's mm -hmm. not going to be exactly the way it was but i feel for the first time and this is really recently because maybe if we had talked a year ago i would have been like yes <laughs> <you're right." laughs> but it's because i'm kind of seeing and i'm hearing and okay. care for the yeah. r&b coming and i think some of these new artists are coming i think you're gonna i think if we go jump back on in, in two years yeah we're gonna have a couple more artists to talk about that we are blown away by but and I think some of those a &R people that are a and in these records, you know, they're starting to care a little more, too. I can mm -hmm. definitely tell you Larry Jackson is is going, definitely going R&B. And his mission is to pretty much save black music. <laughs> well, seems, I mean, seems. that's what we need. I mean, yeah, he's they, the one who did, I haven't heard, he did the soundtrack for Color Purple. I, I haven't heard it. Okay. But that's okay. on Larry. That's Larry who did that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's been a big, I mean, yeah, we had Usher and Hair. Um, Rodney did some stuff. We've got a lot of people on, on that. Um, yeah. Your new artist, I mean, uh, is this on your label or is she signed or what's what's the, the fray? It's, 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 it's on our label and then it's going to be through a major label. Okay. I mean, 
And and, and what, can really uh, what can you tell us about what can you tell us about her and the, and the she's, project? She's, she's, she's a wild one. <laughs> okay, she is a wild one. Uh, she is from Indiana, and uh, she is like uh, six foot tall. Wow. <laughs> uh, and I think I would describe her. You know, when I say R and B, that's not going to be a typical R and B. She's, I would say, she's more wild. You know, I think she's closer to, you know, some of the little more edgier kind of international sound. You know, we're still defining her sound, but she just has this incredible tone. Like her tone is something that's so unique. It's almost, and she reminds me as an artist, she got almost like a Grace Jones kind of appearance. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, which is fun for us because it's really inspiring for us to be in the studio with her. And she can really do, you know, she can rap and stuff like that. She's just, uh, there's no pocket for her. Wow. That's why we, you know, there will be no artists like her when we get this. We just got to get the sound right because we've done so many also R&B records with her, you know, because this is where our yeah. passion is. But we got to turn it up a little bit because she got, she's, She's she's ready. She's like when she does R and B, she's ready to go. You wow. know, she's one of those kind of artists. Where she's not holding. She's not holding back. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we're very very excited about it. We, we just signed her, so it's super new. But super you know, new. she's we're really excited about her. She's really special. She's just an amazing songwriter too. You know, she has some tracks already. Songs. I think one of the songs is going to be on the new Rihanna record, stuff like that. So she's Rihanna. This may be more where we are at actually okay. that's she's also less just soft r&b yeah i would yeah. maybe say if i should compare maybe we're a little more in that world okay well yeah. when 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 do you expect to have at least one of her first singles out first singles should be in six months okay okay around the summer okay how is it now going back to becoming a label head? Uh, do you still have your label back in Denmark? Is that gone or is it still oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> to get some yeah, residuals? Yeah, in Denmark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I really, you know, have set it up so we have her manager is an amazing management, uh, and the major company. I just can't say it yet because yeah, that's... yeah, yeah, but <laughs> so... you know they've. Done a lot of you know big records and big artists and stuff like mm. that and i try to stay because i'm in the studio with her i can't go in as the label business. guy yeah label guy yeah so i really try if i need to get something sort of business wise i'll say to a manager or say to our you know, our person whatever we'll t- take those discussions and they will talk to her because in the studio i if i gotta be her biggest support yeah and safe zone and that's what me and colin does with artists you know that's where that's where we hug and that's where yeah. we so bad we write songs about it and you know so if i start coming in going you know this one could go to this on tiktok that's a tiktok record <laughs> i would shoot myself you know, yeah. get this guy out of here yeah you know, yeah we're so protective of the studio so you know even though there's definitely certainly a more business uh, role in my life these days yeah. Because we also have a lot of new producers on this, and we have two other artists we're developing too. That's kind of what we're doing now. We're setting up a company with new young talent. There's an amazing, there's another Danish producer coming in. So, that's <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, that's kind of why also maybe I can inspire. I like this role a lot more than going back in as a producer. I'm probably, Colin would say, I've become a little more executive, and he's still in the gritty he's still in the dirt zone okay where okay. i'm still maybe withdrawn because i'm dealing more with the setups and the deals and you know we want to make sure all our artists have major record deals or these very good distribution and stuff like that okay so I, I, yeah so i'm a little more than you know when colin calls and i know it's about music then i just go back to focus to more music but I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not in the studio six hours, seven to eight hours a day anymore. It's, uh, those days are gone for me. Wow. I can. I still. I still make a beat here and there, but <laughs> you know, a young producer who's better than me making a beat, I don't mind because I'm more focused maybe on the bigger picture of our new company setup. So you almost like took the role of L.A. Reid while Colin took the yeah. babyface route and said, "Yeah, he's supposed yeah. to be the creative force." Okay. Yeah. And it's funny you bring that up because Mike, me and L.A. have now crossed paths so much lately. And, 
you know, because I was an expected judge and he was an expected judge. Oh, and yeah, uh, he yeah, hired yeah. me in America. Ele hired me to do all his tracks and beats for his artists and X-Factor. And I had just came off being a judge in Denmark. And he wanted to have me because I had experience. And he had the same experience as I had, which was, what are we doing here? <laughs> what are we doing with the judge? And I, I quit after one season and LA quit after season. Yeah. Half because he came to me one day and he said, so would you have signed any of these artists? And I go, nope. He goes, <laughs> and then he said to me, what are we doing here? And I said, do you remember when you called me? I said, you're going to tell me, what are we doing here? <laughs> He's had to see it himself. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. did you guys ever talk yeah. about the Monica and the Whitney record? Do you ever joke about that? Oh, no, we don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> No, that one, we need the oil alone. We don't want to get LA upset. You know, we just give them a nice bottle of red wine. So we're good. Okay. Don't talk about those songs. Don't talk about those songs. <laughs> but the, the thing is that when we talked about Tracy and, and say, Monica, could you ever go back and work with some of those veteran artists and, and try and absolutely. put up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we almost did work with Monica recently, actually. And Tracy, we're certainly gonna end up, I know we're gonna end up doing a song with her. I can I can just tell already because she's so much in our life right now again. And she's just such a sweetheart. She's just such a special artist. So absolutely. And you know it's fun you bring it up. If you had said this like two or three ago, so I go, no, 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 we're gonna move on to a new generation. Mm. But I'm also noticing what's amazing over here. When you see touring, some yeah. of the biggest touring acts. Yeah, new edition. I mean, all yeah. The acts. yeah, and Jodeci, also in yeah, Park. It's yeah. Crazy. yeah. And I've noticed, like, you know, everybody now, it almost, almost like a lot of that generation go, listen, you guys, let's show you how we do this. Yeah. I see so many of these old, like, uh, older artists, Buster Rhymes coming new album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marcus back and making an album, like Missy and Timbaland are going. I mean, it just seems like because we're missing something. Yeah. It's almost, yeah. Like, okay. Let's dust us off. Let let's give you a couple of good records, and maybe that can lead to inspire you guys. Yeah. But I don't blame the new generation. I must be terrible having to make music for TikTok or or sit on a computer and not be in studio and just yeah. yeah. It's so hard to make good songs, you know. Yeah, no, it definitely is. But I, I, you know, I liked what Jimmy and Terry did when they had their they their 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 soundtrack where they had. Mary, no, yeah, what well, had Mary Boyce to Man Usher, and, and they had all these guys, people on their album. And I wondered if there would ever be a Soul Shock and Carlin compilation where you are getting Monica or Tracy Spencer or um or any of the people that you Jojo, if she if she's you know, she's still singing and stuff, um, to come in and that, that, and... that that's a great idea. I never thought about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I never thought about that actually. I I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, we. But, you I don't know, think I... So. but I. But, but I do. Love, but I do. I. We. I, I can. I can see us work with some of the artists we worked with before. I can easily see that happen. But I'll say right now, actually, because we over the last year and a half, two years, we've been more in the studio than we've been for like five, six years, just because I have been not been working. Yeah. And the more we get out there, the more we meet some of the art. Oh, actually, there's some good new artists coming. There's some there's some good stuff going on out there. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. I know it looks really bad and it's been really rough yeah. ride for Aunt B. And man, I mean, that's why it's incredible. I'm the one saying it because if you talked to me a couple of years ago, I would be <laughs> going mad if you're going. It's the worst. Like, what is going on? Yeah. I've had to, to write a song. And why can't I can't hear what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, the mumbling guy. Like, I don't know what the fuck you're saying. <laughs> you know, so, but anyways, I actually I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot. I'm okay. seeing and I'm seeing some of these old school cats. You know, Mark Pitts, Larry Jackson is a beautiful. La Reeves, he has a setup now, also yeah. under Larry's okay, setup. It's just it's gonna come. It's gonna I, I feel because your reaction. What the hell's going on? We have had that, but okay. we're a little bit ahead inside the business. And we there's always a reaction going now. There's that always had that all, uh, all already has happened. That reaction yeah. to what's going on. So yeah. that you see it, you see it because 
we're not we're not having this no more we, yeah no no we, we gotta we gotta stop this you know too, that's just been too many bad rb records it's like and you buy an album and you go <laughs> you yeah me? what is the point i mean and as i said just just dropping our singles um we can't end by not talking about the fact that on the 29th of november you release a book now it wasn't in english so i couldn't tell whether this was an autobiography or what was it the, the book that you released i'm gonna week. get a copy for you so you can see it <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you know, when I went uh, to business school, you know, I was I was educated in sales. So no, <laughs> this is uh, this is actually a special project for me because uh, it's it is about everything. I don't know if you can see. You yeah, I can see me. you with Whitney. <laughs> I can yeah. see you with. Uh, that's Clive. Oh, with Clive, yeah. Okay, that's so you actually were addressing. I... So you were look at me. That's York. why I came to New York. This is the guy that. Come on. <laughs> okay. Did you okay. want to work with that guy? <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> so um, this is a little bit part of my therapy. With what has happened, this is book has a lot of stories about our uh, incredible journeys in music business. It also has a lot of personal stories, and I didn't want to write a book uh, without going really kind of deep because when I started in my business or started in the business, it, it's a very lonely ride to have these high ambitions. Mm -hmm. Your friends are saying you're nuts. Your family is saying you're crazy. Yeah. And I go, no, I'm going to America. I'm going to work with Whitney Houston. <laughs> okay. Settle down now. Um, and then I used actually books and documentaries and stuff about people who had um, had these careers and stuff like that. But I all the books that were like, I'm the man and I, I'm just Superman. I didn't get anything out of that because I couldn't, then I can't associate with you. If yeah. you're Superman, you can fly. I can't fly, so yeah. how am I going to learn anything from you? So it's important to me if I did something like this, I would inspire people sitting out right now having these dreams and ambitions, and they don't go for it. And mm -hmm. and I'm not one of those like Arnold Schwarzenegger books where it's like you <laughs> just got to go. Yeah. <laughs> there is no plan B. I don't know yeah. if you read it. It's hilarious. I love it actually, <laughs> uh, but but. Um, but what I want to say to most people is try. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I talk a lot about is I, I have this six months thing. If you can get financial secure for six months, if you have a house over your head, car, whatever, if you need to transportation, food, then in those six months, that dream you have, devote all the time you can in those six months for mm -hmm. that dream. And the, the lot what a lot of people do mistake in those is they wake up every day don't be like oh yeah and then the next day they doubt themselves mm -hmm. and they doubt what they're doing i want you to not do that for just six months just try and in those six months you know you're going to be fine so you don't have to worry about anything else than the six months you have ahead of you and in those six months you wake up and are positive about what you want to achieve fashion or painter or acting or whatever that's mm -hmm. all you do then after six months then you allow yourself to ask yourself, did I achieve enough? Was I happy doing this? To do another six months. And that's how we did it, step by step. Yeah. And that takes away this constant insecurity and anxiety and pressure. You have. Because no, no, no. In six months, you have agreed to yourself, you just are going to believe in this dream. Isn't that beautiful? You don't yeah. have to worry about anything. And we know in six months we we'll, didn't talk about it, but not now. Now you're going to go all in because you know you set it up. So you rent that house or whatever, blah, blah, you make sure. Of course, things can't just fall apart after six months. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a little bit of a, you know, but it's, I just been trying to explain to you what goes on wrong so many times is that self doubt comes in all the time. Even in a matter of 24 hours, you have. Eight hours we believe in it, and then all of a sudden at nighttime before you go to sleep, you oh my god, what am I doing? I shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where you kind of don't let that ambition or dream you have thrive. Mm -hmm. So 
that's in this book too. So besides, um, of course, a lot of our great stories and stuff for our, for our uh, music uh, career, then it's also a little more of a personal thing also because I went through this traumatic experience. Yeah. And I also want to touch on a little bit, you know, how I got through something like this. Maybe hopefully I can inspire anyone else who go yeah. through something that tragic. Um, I'm still here today and I'm better than ever. Yeah. It wasn't, but you know, so I, I felt it was a good time to do it because it wasn't just, I'm the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you all my. This is much more very personal story, and it's been um, really a success in Denmark. Is were there plans to make it available for the? In- yes, American we are League? already talking about. Yeah, we're getting it translated actually this uh, in a couple of months here, and we're gonna probably send it, put it out in English with a English publisher. Yeah, because okay. it's it's a very different kind of book. It's not. I don't want to sit and say, "Oh, my book is the best." It's yeah. just a very, very personal book. And I don't think you normally get this personal um, side of a story. Um, and again, in America, there's a ton of people achieve what I have. But in Denmark, yeah, it's really special. And maybe that's also part of why it's an interesting story, because I, I was so far away from be should be able to achieve this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, as I said, are, are you well known in Denmark? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when you're an expert, the judge, it's kind of like yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, so they've got their Peter Smichael, they they still know. Yeah. They, okay, so you got you're... this guy who's who's worse than Simon Cowell on TV. <laughs> oh, were you that guy? Were you the mean guy? Oh my god, yeah. But I was. I had to. They had to stop me because I got called in because they got sued and everything. It's a long story. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just said, you want to I just said to her, and I was just saying, beautiful. Man singing from you know you know you have the groups and you have the you know I had the groups which saw the why why did you do with groups and then <laughs> someone had the young ones and the older ones and this was one of the older ones and it was the first show and I was told I was that was the role they kind of saw me in so I was very sweet I said you know when he was done I said you know I want to really help you and I just said you should never ever ever sing here you have <laughs> absolutely no talent at all and you will never ever make it anywhere. And, and now you know that. So now you can move on or you can be a manager or you need something else. I thought it was very sweet. But it turned into the yeah. The oh goodness. Mom suit. And we won we won national Danish TV like BBC. So oh, yeah, I got yeah, called. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I wasn't a success in Denmark. Oh <laughs> goodness. Oh goodness. But your book would be Apart from Denmark, it would it be translated into say Swedish or or, or Norwegian? I think it will just be English. I think it will just be Denmark, Danish to English, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so you think by by the time phrase out, the book might be available for English readers, or um, if not, it's a good opportunity to learn Danish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I can tell you since we've been talking, so your 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 favorite, uh, because it is also, of course, my favorite. So let me just this now. I'm really good. I feel like I'm like, <laughs> but this is actually from the session. Oh goodness! Yeah. So I can see Whitney Kelly. Um, I don't see yeah. Bobby there. <laughs> no, thank God. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble this no, 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 no. We all love Bobby and stuff. Yeah, no. Um, you know, it has been. Uh, one person yeah. sent me a message when when I mentioned I was going to interview. He said, "Can you ask him to talk about?" You know, he meant Tamara Savage um, and Beverly Crowder. Is it Crowder? Crowder? Beverly Crowder? Did you? Um, and, and well, uh, Tamara Savage is the one I told you about. The oh, she was the one who talking. wrote. Yeah, who wrote that? But yeah. she wasn't so a she's singer. The one that's the first session. No, well, she sang the demo. Oh, she did the demo. But okay. she's the one. That, yeah, she's the one. She's the one who sold the demo. I mean, wow. can you believe walking into your first songwriting session yes. and writing a number one record? Wow. Very special, sweetheart, and so talented. Yes, and the other person, Beverly Crowder. Not quite sure who that is. Okay, uh, anthem. Let me see. Was oh, Anthem and Crowder. Oh my God. Oh, Anthem were like, oh my God. Two uh, sisters. I think they were twins, actually. I'm not even oh, so sure. It was Anthem and Beverly. Okay. 
Oh my God, they were the best. They were incredible writers too. We wrote some amazing ones. I don't even know, if, was that maybe the 702 record they wrote? I, I can't remember. They were so special. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. That's really people who know who we work with. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's yeah. Oh, Some of the, uh, that you're bringing us some of our best moments in the studio because uh -huh. they were, you know, when we have talented people in like that, it just, just, we are all so excited, you know, wow. because we can feel it in the room that what we're making is special. Yeah. And then I think the final one was Craig David. Now, could you mention, was that the album with What's My Flavor? Was that the album you worked on? Was it a different yeah. album? Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, I didn't quite understand that single, Craig. Don't kill me. <laughs> and that's what I was going to say, because his first sing album was groundbreaking, you yes. know, and yes. when he came out, when he when we all knew, because by the time he came out with the second album, I had moved back to the UK from America. So I was 93, uh, 2004. So when he came out with that Watch Your Flavor, I think it, it confused us because this was, it, it took us away from what we were used to. Yeah, and and I course. think, unfortunately, the your first single was your first impression. And I think that really just became hard for us to go yes. past the single and listen to the album and stuff. Um, and not only that, we, we, I don't know if I did it directly with Craig, but I certainly did with his manager. Yeah, I said, you know, first of all, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to kill Craig here because I love him. He's to death. He's one of the most talented mm -hmm. artists we've worked with. And I'm yeah. so proud of Bryson Fall. I think yeah. the song we did with him and Sting is gorgeous. I really, maybe that should have been first single. Yeah, uh, because that still has, and that would have been a wow sting. And it's just thing it would be that flavor record. Also, flavor the word flavor was so gone at that time in mm. America. Yeah, you already had flavor in your ear. Like it was just yeah, yeah. So yeah, it just um, you know, hey, I don't want to say anything negative because he's such a sweet guy and, and yeah. such a talented. But it, I don't think that was a good choice for a single. I really think so because I actually think the album is okay. You know, we did, I don't know, three songs, maybe. I can't remember. Um, you know, his first album was also revolutionary. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, can you remember when you heard Fill Me In at Seven Days first time? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, oh, yeah. Oh, my God! Yeah, and it was very <laughs> clean. It was very different. It had the, the garage stuff and the <clears> guitar, <throat> the, the, uh, yeah. and, and yeah. we could hear what he was saying. And he introduced us to, I mean, even the, the whole step, yeah, the whole... The melody uh, yes. throughout it. Yeah. And again, one of the things that I found was the hardest thing because we were in England a lot of those days and we were working with a lot of these UK R&B bands. And I'm not going to mention any names, but the level was so beyond American artists. Mm. Not because they're not talented, because they didn't take the task serious enough. And that's one of the things I noticed when I came back to X Factor in Denmark too. I'm like coming in and like, we're starting at six o'clock with dance lists and whatever. They're like, no, my dad has a birthday and my brother-in-law is getting married. And I'm like, <laughs> this is not going to go well. So, you know, and I'm not saying, but I, but the, and Craig didn't. Craig was fucking hardworking. And he was ripping those vocals up and we were comping the vocals. He was more involved in comping the vocals than we were. And he mm. made all the right choices. You know, he was such a, he was like an American artist. Yeah. And then I will say one thing I have to say when we talk about UK artists, because I mentioned my two favorite records, Do For Love and, and Heartbreak Hotel, but there's actually an UK artist that is my third favorite record of all time. And that's Jamelia, thank you. Wow. I love that song we did with her. Yeah, I don't Jamelia. know if you remember. Thank you. Yeah, it is and Jamelia, such a great she, record. She was yeah to, to be an R&B artist at the time she came in and not be on a show. She did really well. It's just I, yeah, she but other things you know happened yeah, that really yeah, derailed yeah. her career. Yeah, but it's Ooh. just that one song we did. That's a great. Song. Also, the way she's using "Thank You" and I remember she was in the studio. I hope it's okay. I'm telling just t ten seconds. No, no, she's writing this. She came out of a really bad relationship with her ex-boyfriend mm. and um but she would still have feelings for him and still in love with him so she's writing this song and in the middle of this we don't really know what she's talking about she's like thank you and i'm like what are you thinking like and then she goes one minute i'm just gonna call my ex and i'm like what the fuck <laughs> and she calls him and i think she misses him 
and he's such an ass on the phone. And she goes, thank you. And that's what that song is. It's oh, thank you. Well, because now I know. For, wow. Yeah. For show me who you really are. It's a fucking great concept for a song. We were talking about concepts. Yeah. I was blown away by Amelia. And she was so gorgeous and is so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just, we, that, that was another great experience we had. Yeah. She, I mean, she, but then she a lot worked, of yeah. other... A lot of other UK artists, we just, you know, it's just hard. We came from Whitney, you know. <laughs> yeah, because I know you did, you did stuff with um, JLS and... Um... Oh, I love that song. That's a great record, too. That's a little <laughs> more pop. That's a, that's a hot beat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You did, And then I think you did with... Um, um, oh, what's her name with Miss Dynamite? Alicia Dixon. Alicia Dixon, Alicia Dixon yes. Breathe, yes. Breathe Slow. That's a nice song, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let me just see the last one. There's somebody says David Clarkson says, um, "Are you the one by Usher and and Shiro's unreleased wow. song Good Loving?" Someone really knows their stuff here. I'm <laughs> yeah. very impressed. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, this is Alex. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting. That song with Usher was only on the European uh, edition of the CD. It wasn't on the American CD. We were pissed off about that. Yeah, we couldn't <laughs> believe it. We, we, we went deep on that, right? We found out that Kraftwerk used to use speak and spell, which is this old child. Uh, yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Kraftwerk made an old song called Numbers One. And they have this robot voices going one, two, three, or whatever in the song. And I was obsessed with Kraftwerk. So <laughs> we found the speak and spell, and we're saying U S H E R with that machine. So we thought, oh, this is going to be special. And then they're like, yeah, they only made the European CD. We're like, you motherfuckers, we spend all this time with these speaking spells. <laughs> was that Clive or was that L.A. Reid? Oh, I don't know. It's probably L.A. Reid. <laughs> it might have been Payback. <laughs> payback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Cheryl's 98 on release, Good Loving. Is it Cheryl? Oh, my God. God, who knows all these songs? <laughs> you got fans. <laughs> Shiro was actually, Shiro was our own artist because Virgin gave us a record label. Wow. And she was our first artist on that. But you know, we were so busy. We didn't pay enough attention. We, wow. we, you know, poor Shiro, she would get us like for like two hours and all, oh, we got to go, you know, so and so and call, you know, we got to go. Usher's calling, you know, it was just like, it know. was, and we just didn't put enough time into a record label as we are now, you know, that's okay. why it's, I feel more in a better position now to, I'm more calm also what I've been through and stuff like yeah. that. So that's what I mean, that having the executive role, I'm starting to enjoy actually being a little more an executive and oversee all this new talent that we have some great, we've got like, Great new writers coming, great new production teams coming. It's gonna be so much fun. I I'm so happy being back working. Is your son jo is your son Johnny, or you, you want him to find his own way? He, he is not listening to me. He does not want any of my help. He doesn't want to play his beats for me. Oh. He is obsessed with Britain. He, I'm gonna do it my way. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. And I get it. You know yeah. what? I kind of get it. Like if you, if I was son of someone, I wouldn't want that either. Because then people would just say, and he says that, you know, he's already like, you know, there's this, um, I think Source Magazine came out with this like top hundred of new underground mm. hip hop just to watch. And he's on the list. Wow. You know, so proud of him. Yeah. But it's underground. He is, I mean, underground hip hop. And I think he, he doesn't even want to say who dad is because yeah. if he says, fuck, that's all they want to talk about. And he has had call me from sessions where the artist wants to talk to me. And I can see that that must not be cool for him in the studio that I don't want to talk to your dad, you know? Yeah. Cool. So I think he doesn't even say, you know, he doesn't even say he's son of me, but his producer name is 47. Oh, he's going to kill me now. <laughs> that, that, you know, in a way, if he doesn't need the money, and I, when I say it is where the, he's not like needs for rent and stuff, it is good to be able to, just like you did, to find your own way where you know that if it doesn't work out, you could always make it back home because it, it wasn't for the money. But your parents, as much as they, they were frightened of you being in New York, still, you know, let you do find your own way. And, and let me find my way. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Thank you for that. And I, and I think I, I really see that in him. He just does not at all want to 
um, use that. And I also think maybe the years we've been through and the, the, the losing mom and stuff like that, he is very calm, strong individual. Like I can really tell he is very focused and uh, he doesn't need any of um, all that he wants to do in his way. And, you know, even though we, we're, we're doing very well, you know, I, you know, I'm my dad, I come from a, and by the way, just let's say my dad was a professor, that was hard work. My grandmom and granddad, my granddad was a truck driver. My granddad on my dad's side was a railroad worker. Wow. He, when he said he wanted to be academic, thought he was crazy. <laughs> he came out of school at 12 years old and he had to start working. So he is also, maybe he, my dad saw that in me in some way yeah. that he also went through this. And even mm -hmm. though he had no idea what I was talking about when I was like, have you heard this new word we did with Jungle Bros? He's like, <laughs> no. When, when yeah. did they finally, when did mom and dad finally say, wow, we now understand. Well, actually, what what yeah, was the moment? It was a couple of times because my dad was in, a, in a, there was a big uh, economic convention in, in Germany. And he was one of the speakers down there, blah, blah. Can you imagine how boring that must be? No. <laughs> um, and uh, and he kind of left this convention. He's walking through, I think it was in Hamburg or Berlin, whatever. And he's like, he goes into this record store. And this is very early on, but I had just done a remix of Jungle Boss. And that, that was done in his house. In my <laughs> and all over the cover of uh, Straight Out the Jungle, it's a Soul Shop remix. And he lifts up and he came back and he goes, I'll be damned. It, 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 is your record? I goes, yeah, yeah. So that was the first time. But then, I mean, the whole American trip, I mean, I mean, they were so proud of me. It's a beautiful feeling. I mean, they're so proud of me. Wow. You can so proud of everything, you know, just, I mean, I, my mom couldn't believe it. She's just like, she couldn't believe it. She's just going up. Yeah, yeah. And my dad now, you know, he, he I even, you know, when I think he turned uh, 70 or 75, whatever, I gave him a keyboard and he's now playing music and stuff like oh. that. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's always the full, the, the final, the full circle of them appreciating yeah. what you're doing, being proud, proud of what, you, what you're doing. And, um, and, but also the fact that you, you came back from, you know, he said you woke up one morning, girls and everyone was around and you're like, what has happened here? And then being oh, yeah. able to, you know, yeah. Well, that's, you. that's through my parents too, because I would come home and I would, you know, they, I would just like, you know, calm back, remember who you are, back to your core. You know, I was, a, again, thank God I was aware of it. You yeah. know what I mean? That's, 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 I'm so, I see some tragic stories, you know, around me, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I'm okay with, with, with going through success uh, got to me. Uh, I think it will for most people, you know, yeah. in different levels, but yeah. it will, I can yeah. guarantee you. Yeah, wow. I mean, it has been yeah. great. I think I, yeah, if yeah, you had your five top five producers, who would, you know, not outside of yourself, but if you had five producers who you'd put in your top five bracket, who, which five would make that top five? Teddy Riley, Teddy, okay. Teddy Riley. Yeah. Um, we definitely, you know, as we talked about, he is 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 probably the one I studied the most. Wow. Um, we talked about who we talked about. Um, you've, well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to fit that, you know. You, you've, yeah, I don't want to. to I, I'm, all the producers you've talked about, I've spoke. I, I can remember in my head, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to uh, influence. Well, your, I mean, you know, you know. Well, you know my whole, you know, the whole Q-tip. and Yeah, you mentioned uh, Dylan and Q-tip, yes, yeah. Dylan, Dylan and Q-tip, maybe I can put them together or, yeah. because I feel that sound they came yeah. definitely uh, on the top. Then I have an unusual one for you, Trevor Horn. Wow. Yeah, why is that? Because he's done some of my favorite records, like Out of Noise, Moments in Love. It's one of my all-time favorite records, and I think... I was obsessed with Trevor Horn because he uh, did some crazy records. He did mm -hmm. some, you know, Malcolm McLaren, you know, crazy mm -hmm. Buffalo Dance, crazy drums. Wow. Um, you know, he was always made this very unique. So even Yes, Owner of a Lonely Heart, I just 
the way he uses reverb and all of a sudden it gets dry. So he's an unusual, you probably didn't see that coming, but he is mm. definitely in my top five. Hard not to put Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis in there, isn't it? <laughs> because it, you know, you guys are a partnership as well to see how, totally. how you and guys then, work. And I'm talking about all the way back to SOS band. Yeah, and stuff. Uh, yeah. I think that they're, they're probably the most un, underrated producers because they've done so much for so long that we people don't rem- they, they think of them, I think, because of their success with Janet, I think people forget the big catalogs. Lou, uh, Alexander O'Neill, SOS Bands, um, um, yeah. Sounds of Black. And then I have to, just because, you know, maybe it's taking me longer to realize it, but um, Quincy Jones, we have to put him in there because, you know, I was just watching the documentary of oh, Thriller. Was a, um, a thriller 40, yeah. There's a 40, 40 is a thriller. 40, oh. yeah, yeah. And just unbelievable. And, you know, even Michael Jackson's demos, who are already fucking unbelievable. <laughs> Really, they are. But you know, Quincy, I got. I, it's impossible to have a top five that he's not on there. So yeah, so Teddy yeah. and Dylan and Q-Tip, if we put them to count together, yeah, 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 yeah. Terry Lewis, Trevor Horn, and Quincy Jones. And Quincy be, Jones. Wow. Okay. I think I'm okay with that. You didn't yeah. see the Trevor Horn coming, I know. No, no, I didn't. But it, it, it but it, I think that's the thing. The the art, the producers who have, a, like, Carl West was influenced by classical music. So when you hear the Albie Shaw, sort of the classical stuff, and then they said Eddie F was teaching them about Eddie less F. is more and, oh, and all yeah. that stuff. So they were learning how to be New Jack producers on the spot because he was a key, he was a classical stuff. So it is amazing how, but but Eddie learned from Teddy. So you can see where, where that, 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 that came yeah. down from and stuff. Yeah. All time favorite yeah. song. What would be your all time favorite song? Just <laughs> because we all have it. Like mine is Michael Jackson's for "The Lady in My Life." I just it is a song that is so magical that I can't listen to it too often because I do, it's that special for me. But do you have a a song? I'm gonna that's go like, Quest. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go Twilight Quest. Which one, Bohemian uh, Electric, oh. relaxation. Electric Relaxation? Electric wow. Relaxation. Wow, it's gonna be my favorite. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think anyone can beat that song for me. Wow. It's just um, when I heard that Tribe album and that song, then then that's for me. It's uh, yeah, isn't that's just Tribe Called Quest, man? They they got me hard. <laughs> so that's my that's, that's I have to say that's my that's my all time favorite song. Wow! Did you ever work with Q? Un, probably Q-tip. unexpected? No, well we we know we crossed path a lot, and also you know Q Tip is Q Tip. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't he, think he needs anyone. <laughs> he doesn't need anyone to stay around. So let we, we'll just let Q-tip be Q-tip, you yeah. know. But you know, but for me, for me, but if you ask me, what's your all-time favorite record? I would say Twelve Pro Chris. Wow. Yeah. Because you were part of Flavor Week Unit, did you ever meet up with KG from Naughty? I did. did. Okay. Yeah, amazing. Oh my God! I mean. Naughty by Nader, did they? Did he kill those productions or what? Yeah. Oh my God, Hip Hop Away and all the I, my God, just incredible. Okay. And Sweet Sky Well, Tracy actually knows him very well because I think they worked together. Yeah, so I've interviewed KG. Um, in fact, I you know he um I've interviewed KG and he talked about his grown up getting into being a DJ, but we forget about Divine yeah. Mills. So he had Next and Coffee Brown and Jaheem. He yeah. did Jane. He produced yeah. it, all that production and, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. So, so but, but the, when you ask those guys, like those fair producers, is there something, sometimes someone was unexpected coming in? No, I mean, most of them would, would, would always go Jimmy and Terry. Some people might add Timberland. Um, some might add the Neptune. You know what? Uh, that That's a good point. I think, I think he's not, I mean, he is right there. Yeah, he's yeah. right there. Yeah. He's right there. I mean, one in a million is one of my all-time <laughs> favorite records of the year. Yeah. You know, so that's on my top like three or five list of all-time favorite yeah. records. Um now I'm not gonna say anything bad about him. We're just gonna mm. say Timberland. Yeah, but yeah. We, as I said, most people with most of them could have who have I um yeah, most of them like when I interviewed um uh one of my favorite was Chucky Booker, he talked about Barry White. 
So oh, his, his Chucky Booga. Yeah. Man, he plays some keyboards or what? Yeah, I love Chucky. Oh my <laughs> God. Yeah. Oh, the king. Yeah, king. Chucky. Yeah, he's one of my. Yeah, yeah. We, we've. Yeah, we, you know. Yeah. So that, that, as I said, when I have conversation with producers, it's so much fun because you guys have so many stories, not just behind the music, but your influences to some of these fun, fun records. And um, but as right. I said, even Tim and Bob, a lot of people would say LA and Babyface, like sorry, like Jim and Terry. Then they'll say. Babyface, and I'll say which version of Babyface, the LA and Babyface, <laughs> or are we talking about the Babyface after the after they split? Because he was at different levels when he did the LA and Babyface, and when he did just Babyface. And yeah, so the reason why you know I, I thought about putting them on the list when you asked me, and um, there there's just uh, just from a nerdy production point of view, mm -hmm. Jamie James her lose. I've just done consistent, and maybe that's what I want to say about Simple and Two, the consistency of these producers I'm talking about. Yeah. Has Teddy Riley ever done a bad record? I don't know if he has. I mean, I think Teddy started when he was like 15, 12 or so. No, and, and he said, you know, <laughs> has, has Quincy, you know, so I think what I, has Trevor, you know, maybe, you know, but even Seal, even though maybe I'm not super connected to it, but, you know, and, you know, and, and the reason why I'm sitting here faking around is that um, when we're going here, come on. Oh, I don't think I heard it. But <laughs> oh, I don't think I can hear it, but what you play? What, can you hear it? Or you can no, hear it? No, no. Oh, we can't. Oh, shit. Okay. I'm playing uh, electric relaxation. I okay, no, it. okay. Oh, I, I could hear it. No. Yeah, no um, and Alien Babyface, again, I think the depth of you know, you go back to set SOS bands and Alexander O'Neill's or whatever, you know, just just incredible what Jimmy Jam and Terry have done. And then you go to this massive records they did with Jenna where they create a whole sound around, which, which is a little bit when we talk about Faye and we talk about Craig David mm -hmm. and having those album, you know, that's what we're trying to do with Faye here is actually not just, we want to come into something going, whoa, and maybe yeah. influences of all the stuff we've been through in our life, you know. You know, because we are also very, we love Brixton sound. We were very into the whole drum and bass stuff like that. A lot of, you can hear them while productions are. Yeah, married. 702. That was going to wonder was, was that yeah, influenced by drum and bass? Yeah. Drum and bass inspired, right? You know, because we would do, we would always go to London. We would always go to Brixton. We always go hang out because they, they, they got this, this bass sound. They yeah, had. yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to okay. say when I listened to that. You They're making, know. wow, the 303 basses, they fuck, they, you know, they, they're, they're so. They're so unique. They're mm. so special, and um, and we always try to incorporate in that in our music a little mm. bit. So that's why I think I think what we're gonna try to do. And funny enough, when we talked about me against the world, it's gonna get in because we talk about Teddy Riley and my and Jay Dilla, mm. my favorite producers. If you listen to me against the world, that's me on the beat paying respect to Teddy Riley on the beat. <laughs> Then the sample is the same sample that Tribe Called Crest used, Mini Ripperton. Mm -hmm. So Me Against the World consists of, it's a tribute in our little nerdy world to all our inspirations. Not many people know that, but that's really why that beat is so Teddy. And that snare is the closest I've been to a Teddy Riley snare. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make sure he finds this out. Like, uh, yeah. I'll I'll send our message. Make sure he hears this because uh, yeah, <laughs> wow, yeah. As I say, he's my all-time favorite. So I don't play around with Teddy. Yeah, he's my all-time yeah. favorite. He, yeah, he's he's number one on my list too. He's the yeah. number one producer. You know, I think that top five I gave was pretty much maybe in order. Actually. No, yeah, and you know, it's hard. To, I mean, there's there, there's so many people that that so many producers over the years. But it's 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 important to list people who have influenced you in some ways and and stuff, and so no one will will ever uh, knock you for that. We no, are, I, I think we do know. it all the time. I think that's part. I think we pay respect to each other. I think that's part of the fun when you are you know producing or even artists too. You know they will pull in stuff from other. I think that's great. That's what music is about. Yeah, and then and and I think as fans we 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 got to a point where for the first time in the nineties where 
we started following the producers, which wasn't yeah. which wasn't the case yeah. in the before. Before you just buy an album and stuff, you don't really care who wrote and produced. The nineties became, oh, this is a Timberland production, or this is a Teddy production. And all of a yeah. sudden, yeah, totally. it took yeah, yeah. Or the Neptunes and it took away from the artists oh, having any credibility. Okay. Neptunes, they are sitting right off that top five. <laughs> Not necessarily for Robot himself, but Neptunes with Yeah, with, the Neptunes. With, but you have yeah. Rodney Jerkins as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it 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 is it, it, there's a lot of people, but you know it everyone's. But then yeah, Neptune's yeah. and and Rodney were all part of Teddy's camp, and so they all learned from, sure. under him and stuff. Yeah. Same as and Eddie Missy and too, wasn't and Missy and Jody C wasn't there? So Devante, Missy wasn't... Timberland, um, yeah, Tweet oh, were all part of Devon. Virginia Beach. Yeah, the, the whole the whole. Have you yeah. had Teddy on the show? No, not yet. He's 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 because he's, he's everyone. Uh, Timmy Gatlin, who was the original member of Guy. Uh, Damien Hall from Guy. If you get Teddy on the show, you you call me or you text me because I'm gonna watch that. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will. Yeah, he he's yeah he's he yeah he yeah he he's he's gonna be yeah he's gonna be one of the I, I, like your Whitney Houston story. I, I am he's the one that's always elusive. Like, well, I'm gonna do this first, and and, and I'm like, I'll interview everyone else. Before I interview him, so that it doesn't come like interview yeah. Teddy, I can retire now. So, I, so that that that's is it. you get Teddy Rawls. That's it. That's yeah. your mic drop. That yeah, mic drop. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I had Elder Barrett, and that was almost a mic drop situation when he talks about how he wrote songs and 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 his own journey and stuff. And so, yeah. So even even Cassidy, DJ Cassidy, I'm trying to get Tracy. Yeah. So I don't know if you could put a good word in for me. I'll tell Tracy. She'll, she'll get on. I'll tell her. Yeah. She'll get on the show. Can I interview Sinise and, and everyone? Her. Yeah. You know what? As soon as I get up, I'm going to call her. Okay. Yeah. I hope you, you actually found it fun. I, you know, I know you, you <laughs> I've kept you for Oh, a while. I had a great time. Oh, my God. <laughs> I had a great time. Yeah, this is a long one. How long have you been on? It's crazy. I would say it is about 1.30 in the morning here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the longest interview I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so that's what it's like when you talk to a therapist. Okay, you don't man. you don't realize what time it is. Yeah, I stuff. know it's great. <laughs> no, I had a really good time. Thank you so much. I'm happy I did it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Final final your favorite film, because I always got your favorite music. Favorite film? What's your like if you are stuck in a lift and you need to like let me watch my all time favorite film, what would it be? Putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, how about uh, oh, so many. You know, I mean, if I'm escaping the Godfather, oh, you know, how about um, No Country for Old Men? Wow, goodness, the Farley brothers, not the Farley brothers, the um, fa um, the brothers, the Coen brothers. brothers, Coen brothers. Wow, that's uh, okay. Huh. You didn't see that coming either. I thought you were going to. No, 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 no. I mean, people talk about Shawshank Redemption or, or or Five Heartbeats, or some people say The Godfather or or, or yeah. Goodfellas. No, I, that's why I wanted to do something that wasn't like obvious. I mean, it's easy to do The Godfather, or whatever. You know, I have so many. You know, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson is another. I love his movies too. I love Boogie Nights too. I don't know. Okay. Love I love Tarantino. It could have been Pulp Fiction or whatever. But No Country for All Men is the one. If that if that gets on. Yeah, no one has ever said, okay. I thought you were going to say um, Girl with the, the Dragon, to the, 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 the Danish film, I think, with the Girl with the no. Dragon. I don't uh, even know that. Oh, you don't even know it. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. I yes. appreciate you. And yes. I appreciate it. So I had a good time. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm grateful and that if you, you need did. Anything else, just let me know. Pardon? Oh, I miss you. Do you said. need anything else? Or yes, anything? no, definitely. So when it comes out, if yes, I'll. I'll no. Yeah, I will. And yes, if if you let me, if uh, you have yeah. a lot of editing to do. <laughs> well, yeah, no, normally, yeah, with with something like this, what it what it will it will go into different parts, part one to probably thirty, because <laughs> there's a lot. But that's the part, you know, because I want people to appreciate all the all the, all the stories and stuff, and that's the it's the inspiration that you had and stuff. So. Yeah, so I'll be working on this um, um, over the weekend and stuff like that. But I really appreciate the time you, you've taken and stuff like that, and especially on a day, you know, birthdays and celebrations. But it's been, it's been, I really appreciate you taking time and stuff. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of Halftime Chat. Please remember to subscribe, share, and comment. 
But most importantly, why don't you become a member of Halftime Chat? We've got amazing videos, amazing perks, and um, being able to support the channel. But anyway, thanks for watching. Take care. I never participated in that category. Hey, the fire in between. Us, or even loving us. On which I didn't miss you. Really. Hey, hey, hey. What was it like growing up? It is a fish that can impact on people's houses down. I ain't have a crew. I didn't get this one and that one. But that works for me, but just for me, I got that. No, 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 okay, you're okay. The only thing with those boys and women, I'll just get it to you. Lay it. Okay, right now, I'm just dying. I'm working. I mean, I love all different jobs.